It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. Not except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. Damn right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Just stone cold set so. If you're gonna blitz... Come strong, but don't come at all. We'll try to come stronger than the Longhorns did on Saturday, that's for sure, on this week's edition of the Blitz. Gentlemen, you only get a first chance to make a first impression. And it's safe to say the first impression of the Tom Herman era in the eyes of many was a big steaming turd. <laughs> Texas loses 51-41 to Maryland. I don't know how if anybody saw that coming. If you saw that coming... I hope you went to Vegas. Fear the turd. Oh. <laughs> That's pretty Thank good. Thank you, Matt, for making yeah. the jokes. You got to get, uh, yeah, get that in. Didn't plan on starting the season off on this note, but here we are yet again. Going to discuss a debacle in so many ways, shapes, and forms. I don't even really know where to start, but we will do our best. And by the way, we got a game to talk about because Texas plays this weekend against San Jose State, trying to get up off the mat. And oh. You got one more rod before what we thought was going to be the real one against Southern Cal in the Coliseum. But uh, safe to say the non-conference slate just got pretty interesting. Yeah, I got to tell you, at this point, <laughs> I have no idea how the season's going to turn out. Yeah. I'm so scared because it could ease it. They looked like the 5-7 and seven team that, you know, we saw last year, which was obviously the – the reason that Charlie Strong is no longer on the 40 acres. And I didn't see the Tom Herman effect. Or if it was, it was a minuscule effect. Very, it was not as profound minuscule. as I thought it was going to be. And if that is the case, then Texas is just a five to six win team. And I think the schedule is tougher this, this year than it was last year. With no Deontay Foreman, mind you. Yep. Is this the bump in the road or a sign of things to come? We will break it all down here on the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. I am Jeff Howe. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire. Not the man behind the glass, but the man that sits to my right now as uh, we're going on video this week in the reincarnation of the Blitz, our first video. Matt Butler, what's up, Matt? Oh, I actually oh. was thinking along the same lines y'all were talking about this game, and it sort of just looked like the same players from last season had a couple months, and they were the same players this season out there on the field, so... They're big, interesting. They're, they're bigger and they're bigger and bigger and faster. I think, right? Is that, that's what everybody was telling me? Aren't they bigger and faster? Yeah, well, I that's haven't what seen the measurements. That's what the conditioning coach kept saying that they're bigger and faster. Well, I didn't. I didn't see bigger and faster. You could see different bodies during mm. fall camp. So they just changed their bodies. They weren't <laughs> different there. bodies. What's the point? Of not getting bigger and faster. You should uh, be getting bigger and faster or more I explosive. Don't know. You they, know, I I don't know why they were it. not the the fastest team out there. They're yeah, they Maryland's, didn't look the most athletic at times. Yeah, or the Maryland's most instinctive speed. or the most physical. Wouldn't the Big Ten team show you that they look they're faster than a Texas team or the most prepared? Yes, yeah. yeah. an East Coast team. Not even it's like they're um, they had to it was a move up yeah, in athleticism. It really to the was. Big Ten, yeah. I mean that was shocking. A band that did not lose very many games in September when he was on the Forty Acres and Rod, am I right? Only two, I think. Right? I didn't NC, lose. NC, State, yeah, and NC State. I talked about that one. Stanford. Oh, don't remind me about them. Yeah, that was, that was it. No other September losses for you, right? Yeah, but I. So I. Yeah, we were seventeenth, I believe. We were ranked seventeenth in the country before we lost to NC State. So I remember the humiliation. Three punts blocked. Bad special yeah. teams. Yeah. Tom Herman's first game as a GA. Oh, Tom Herman had a screw up in that game, didn't he? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about some screw ups or alleged <laughs> screw ups. He still mm. hasn't learned. No, just joking. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to turn this into a bash, Tom Herman. But there's a lot of stuff we got to talk about. But anyway, uh, a man who knows his football. Back on the airwaves, by the way, since we yes. are now a member of the 1049 Horn family, we have got the broadcast every day on the Horn from one to three. One to three, with man. Rod B. The beautiful thing. Some good football talk with Rod B from one to three. It was. It was. It was fun, man. It's fun. I, can't, I actually I missed uh, being on there. It was bittersweet because I had to come on there and talk about what we're about to talk about the dumpster fire debacle. But you love the yes. local programming on the horn now. You got B and E in the morning. Mm. You go to Craig Way for the high school spotlight. That's real. Going to Trey and BK. They got a fun show for a couple hours. Yeah. You got some real hardcore football talk with Rod B. 
and then Chad and Kevin take you home in the afternoon. Yeah, no, I love it. Love it, man. I love it. It's all local, and it's all love, too. So he's on the airwaves. He was a 2002 UT All-American while he was on the 40 Acres. Fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL. Could have been a CFL Hall of Famer. Might be playing with Johnny Manziel and – Playing man. under Art Bryles. Yeah, if you had, had stuck things, around, oh, man. Had things, in a li- and it, things worked out differently over man. everybody's lifetime. Hey, but, man. alas, they were not meant to be. <laughs> so when he was done in Canada, got himself back to Austin, Texas, into 40 Acres, where he earned his degree. If he had a T-ring, he would wear it proudly. He's going up there to get it. He's a card-carrying me. member of DBU. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. And, Rod, oh, man. Um, this is a, a, a nasty, rotting onion that we got to peel the layers <laughs> off of today. Day yeah. and dissect exactly what happened. It's ugly. And there's a number of ways we can attack this game. Uh, and I just want to start by saying this. When I think about last year and the season opener, I don't think from opener to opener you can have two more contrasting outcomes to start yeah. a season. Good point. You know, last year was a Sunday night under the lights and Notre Dame's in town and Texas gets the big win. And you know, everybody thought it was off and running. And then as P.J. Locke told me at Big 12 Media Days, then we went out to Cal and boo-booed all over ourselves, and things <laughs> kind of went downhill after that. Yeah. And P.J. PJ did actually use the word boo-boo, so just want to yeah. throw that in there. Well, there you go. Not paraphrasing there. That was a, that was <laughs> a direct quote. not one that means worse. Yeah. No, no. Love P.J. Locke. Uh, but then this year, Rod, everything's great, and it starts out so well. You get the pick six by Holton Hill, and you think, man, this mm-hmm. thing's off and running. I think we all did. And it pretty much went downhill from <laughs> That point My boy him. I mean, yeah, I it was I I was I, I was probably speechless. Yeah, Holden Hill had time. shins on the uh, he did have shins. Yes, both times I was yelling, where'd he go, Cotton? <laughs> uh, all he is he grew shins in the <laughs> offseason, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. It's a miracle. He's flying. Uh yeah, I mean Holden Hill, and Holden Hill actually didn't have a great game, um actually, in terms of like from a defensive perspective. Exactly. That's what's so funny. He about made a lot of plays though. Well, we've seen the last three years from Texas football times because you it's odd. I love the way that the variance in football really can skew an outcome. Now, Texas has been on the negative end of that for the last few years, but where you have a 80 plays on both sides of the ball, we're talking 150 snaps, 160 yeah. snaps. Yet, if you are really bad on just, say, a handful, five here and five here on both sides of the ball, if those result in points, it can skew entire outcomes or perceptions. So, say yeah. a guy doesn't maybe have a great – game throughout but he makes two big plays it skews you to believe that he had a great game when it also on the other way is say you're doing having good defense for 70 plays but on those 10 is a broken assignment a pick six a block kick it can get those chunk points and you can end up really despite being successful on say 80 percent or 90 percent of the plays still lose because your mistakes are that bad and taken advantage of when it goes to uh the stat jeff Jeff, you had on the on Horns twenty four seven about explosive plays. Yep, Texas yep. won the explosive play battle thirteen to twelve, which, as we know, we talked we talk about a lot yeah. on this show because of the late great Bill Walsh, and we love Bill Walsh and his football philosophy and his book Finding the Winning Edge talks about percentages of winning the games if you win the explosive play battle and incrementally the more explosives you have than the other team, the percentages of you winning how much that increases. But yeah. Texas won the explosives thirteen to twelve. The problem there, Matt, as you're talking about, Texas scored on one of their 13 explosive one. plays. Who know? That was a 33-yard touchdown yeah. from Bouchelle to Foreman. Maryland scored on five of their explosives. There you yeah. go. And Cashed then when you look in. at the fact that you had three non-offensive scores, so throughout the whole game you only had a couple drives. You had that one where you brought up Foreman, and then you had a trash TD late. So really in between you had maybe two drives that really resulted in something from all 13 of those explosive plays. It's You need to finish drives. So in addition right. to having the big plays finish drives, just have the ability to stack those up and then get something out of it instead of, say, a field goal that then gets it's blocked and comes back, and then you get nothing. You just wasted time to give the other team points the advantage. It just doesn't reward you in the overall gameplay. And, and it's we talk about misleading numbers and misleading stats. You know, Tom Herman referenced after the game they did really well against Maryland on third down, mm. which they did. They uh, did third down conversion. Like Maryland of, was three of eleven. Yeah, but you want to talk about two of those third downs Maryland did convert. 
One was a 19-yard run by Tyro Pigram in the second quarter that set up a touchdown to make it 27-7. to mm-hmm. And the other one was the third and 19 late in the game that Kasim Hill hits DJ Moore for a 40-yard touchdown yeah. to set up or to, to for 40 yards to set up a touchdown that puts Maryland up 10 44 Kill the momentum. Yeah. So 3 of 11, yeah, great. Third down defense percentage-wise was That's awesome. Good. But two of the three you gave up. Killed you, yeah. and those are Bag the breakers. things that where you find learn about a team. Are is this going to regress to the mean? Is the production going to overall balance out, and then you end up being able to just play where you don't benefit from the say bad luck, or are you a team that has bad habits? So you this isn't bad luck. This is just the situation that you put yourself in whenever you don't have a successful play. I, I think it's got to be more about the the game plan going in. It was just a subpar game plan yeah. in the end because, yeah. and I think there's different. And we can talk special teams, defense, and offense. But Texas's advantage in this game should have just been you have better athletes than Maryland. Period. At every level of the offense, defense, and on special teams, you have better athletes. So in the end, even though you had mental errors, even though you know there are some coaching mistakes, man, in the end, you would think that at home. Texas would be able to just because of their great athleticism overcome, and that didn't happen. Right. I didn't see Texas able to overcome with just their sheer athleticism or playmaking ability. And that then I'm now I'm questioning whether Texas has those difference makers. Yeah, those game changing players. I mean, where are they? I mean, and, and who are they? Like I and now, so now I'm questioning whether Texas because none of those guys stepped up uh, to end up being like kind of a a go-to guy on offense, or and I think that's what... How would you want to be my go-to guy? <laughs> but, uh, no, I think ultimately that is going to end up affecting the identity of this offense. An identity usually ends up uh, revolving around a go-to presence uh, at wide receiver, uh, running back, not a little guy that, you know, moves the chains, but somebody that changes the game. And I think that's Chris Warren that kind of changes the game, but he, he's obviously not trusted by his head coach, so... He didn't get the foot he football, and the coach doesn't trust the running game because he abandoned the running game. And the offensive line now, even pass protection, they're not trustworthy. So I don't, and I have no idea. And all, and all of this happening with an offensive guru like Tom Herman, kind of watching from the sideline, and they scored twenty points. Twenty points. Man, and that's a big that's, part of talking about when you brought up maybe the idea of being out coached. And there, there, these are certain situations where coaching really can make a difference. Because when you once you get into the week to week schedule, it's really tough to look at it. But it's certain games where you have a whole off season or you have a bowl season to prepare for, or even coming off a of buys, you see the separation in the NFL coaches' records coming off a of buys. Same thing with other players like Urban Meyer. Still, I don't even think he's yeah. lost one. So when you look at those things, then you can see, okay, well, Dark and a guy from the Harbaugh tree a really big football guy like you can tell like this was that Super Bowl for him his team and it looked as if he was very prepared to see what to expect from Herman and Herman's in that idea that it makes total sense too we've had success we're going to run what we run and we're going to beat you at it the thing was is when you do that that sort of allows the opponent to at least get idea of what you do and it looked like Durkin was well prepared for that and now when you get into this week to week thing coach doesn't matter as much but in those certain situations which Texas will have a buy before uh i think it'll actually be in a couple weeks but you aren't going to have any of those for a whole Long eight time. weeks in a row yeah. so we'll see how the adjustments go after that but that's the thing on both sides of the ball and we'll talk about special teams because that's an entirely different Agreed. conversation and that's the thing that i look i feel this this is the kind of game where as a media member based on what you say like you feel dumb afterwards <laughs> that like you bought into x y and Drank z the kool-aid man yeah makes me feel dumb that i bought into some of this yeah. stuff Agreed. uh Two things, Matt. I want to get back to your point here in just a sec. Don't let me forget that. Okay. But when you look at this game as a whole, and when I left the stadium, I there were two games on my mind. I was thinking about the the K State game in two thousand seven and the UCLA game in two thousand ten, both home games that Texas as a double digit ranked team lost. That kind of weird stuff happened and you're just like I have no idea how this happened. Yeah. Like I did not see this coming. Yeah. And this was one of those. Mm-hmm. When I went back and watched the game, it felt more like the Cal game last year. And I on this show I roasted Charlie Strong and Vance Bedford for their game plan against Cal. I remember that. What what Todd Orlando did breaking it down and I know Tom Herman said there were only a few things here and there, 
I would disagree with that because it was the errors when they were there defensively were egregious errors. And there were times, Rod, when they lined up, especially in their third down package, their dime package to blitz, I can't tell you what what was going on. Like, yeah. I can't tell you what the objective was. Yeah. Like, you're going to have to explain to me why – in some of your alignments, you got one down lineman in Puna Ford. You've got six guys loaded on one side, like from the overload. outside shoulder, the tackle yeah. to the hash. Not even a good overload look. It's yeah. like it looks like you're just on like playing on the Xbox and trying to like get guys on one side of the field, <laughs> just like maybe I'll get there before yeah. he gets rid of the ball. And just on offense, it just seemed like the left hand never really figured out what the right hand was doing. It's mm. like that didn't look like a power spread that I saw mm. at U of H. No, that that looked like that looked like an air raid offense. Yeah, and a very mediocre one at that. I say one of the worst. It looked like a bad Big Twelve offense. Well, it, yeah, it, exactly. Because Shane Bouchel <laughs> looked like he was just. I mean, by the end of the game, now we find out about the bruised shoulder, so maybe that can explain no, some it, of the things that he did. Because you saw, it seemed like as if he was going off of the lead option. It was nothing more than ten yards downfield and it was strictly within the framework of the offense and he wasn't doing anything that I thought was diagnosing or making the right decision. If anything, every decision he personally made was staying holding onto the ball too long or was misunderestimating uh, yeah. the athleticism get to, and not getting away. I want to get to Bouchelle in a minute, but that was the point I was going to make, Matt, is you talk about schemes and game plans. I can't tell you what the schemes and game plans were from Texas. I really yeah. can't. I can't tell you what objectives they went into that game. If that was your game plan going into the game, I can't tell you what they were trying to get done. I actually think that was, I, I hate to say it, I think that was their adjustment. It's just sad. Because remember Tom Herman says, at first the defense came out and gave us looks that we just didn't anticipate. We didn't. We weren't prepared for those. I remember him saying yeah. that in the post game. So they came out defensively and – Texas had to really kind of figure out, formulate a kind of a new game plan. And I agree with you. I'm trying to figure out, well, what was the purpose of the the adjustment? What were you trying to exploit? What right. did you find defensively that they were doing that they made themselves vulnerable because they were doing this or this? Because it looked like and, Maryland just decided we're not going to give you the vertical. We're not going to give yeah. Shane Bouchelle the vertical no. throw. We'll give you the short to mid range stuff. We'll give you that all day. If you want to yeah, dink and, we'll and dunk down exactly. the field and you want to try to make 10, 13, 14, it's, it's the Big 12 way of playing defense mm -hmm. that like we criticize. When it works, it's great. When it doesn't, we see that it just means you're on you're kind of bleeding your death it by paper cuts. It's a slow death. But, hey, we're going to make you drive it 13, 14 plays because somewhere along the line we're going to count on you screwing up. Your quarterback's going to miss a read. Your line's going to not pick up a blitz right. Fourth a, down. A wide receiver's going to miss a hot rate, right? Hot read. Something's going to happen that we're going to be able to take advantage of. And credit to Maryland. They were able to take advantage of those mistakes when Texas made them. But to the point about the offense of what it looked like, it looked like the 2010 Texas offense where you don't try to run the ball, you have no faith in the run game. So what did Greg mm. Davis do more often than not that year? Screen put it in Garrett Gilbert's yeah. hands and let's go with God. Yeah. 52 throws. Put it in yeah. put it in State. put it in Seven's hands and let's go with God and see what happens. Pretty much. Yeah. Oddly, they were showing the 2010 Texas Rice game this morning. I watched some of it on Longhorn Network. I don't know why they were showing that. They showed that and the 2011 Texas Rice so, game, no, but It's interesting that you bring up that 2010 Rice game. Um, because this is the this is the team. Remember they had the fourth the four down. Four oh. down yeah, stuffed in the and he got Jared, stuffed by right four Norton downs in, in a row. Yeah. yeah, and I, I remember I remember us talking about that like right. in depth. It's about uh -huh. like man, that man, how can you not get you know goal line uh, first down against or a touchdown against Rice fourth and goal? You know what I mean? But if you start looking at this team now, which we it's clear they still have an offensive identity crisis. Mm -hmm. And I brought this up, you know, at the start of the season. I started the season when Tom Herman was hired, I should say, when he hires Tim Beck. And I said, man, they still have an offensive identity crisis. Now, we assume that they are going to remedy that. They're going to resolve it. They're going to have an identity. But they still don't. No. They've had an offensive identity crisis on the 40 acres since 2010. Yeah. And Deontay Foreman was the only kind of short-term solution for it. Was like, it, it yeah, it was the, well, the identity is – He's a he's a he's going to be an NFL starter <laughs> at one point. I think he probably start before and, the season's over. And that and was by, that, that was, was that was that and wasn't Sean even, didn't want that. That wasn't know? even that they thought that was some revelation. They had to go to Deontay yeah. Foreman because Chris Warren got hurt. They didn't have a choice. And remember option. that Charlie didn't even want to do it. Charlie yeah, he was, wouldn't have done it if it was Charlie up to was him. Like, Charlie wouldn't with. even let him start. Uh, you know his mm -hmm. uh his, what, sophomore Second year. Yeah, yeah. Well, so it was they right. They kind of 
kind of fumbled and stumbled into an identity. Um, but that, to me, is systemic. It's so weird that some of the same issues, I think something is affecting this program, man. I hope I don't sound like I'm getting all like existential here, but no, we've got three different coaches now that have come through the 40 acres in the last seven years or so. I right? the end of Max tenure, Charlie Strong, and now Tom Herman. All those guys are really good coaches. We agree. Texas is a different job altogether, though, in terms of expectations. But aren't, don't you think now we're starting to just recognize the symptoms? Because we keep talking about the same issues, tackling, um, offensive line mm-hmm. consistency, quarterback issues now. We're back to quarterback issues all of a sudden now, apparently. Um, the lack of an offensive identity, defense, being an endangered species. And it's things that we were talking about at the end of Max tenure. We were talking about them all throughout Charlie Strong's tenure. Bad special teams now. Uh, dual threat quarterbacks, killing Texas, which is something that goes all the way back to Mac. Same issues, and I wonder if now they're just symptoms. Mm-hmm. And if, if if nobody has really ever truly diagnosed what happened to Texas football post Colt McCoy, yeah, because post Colt McCoy, Texas is an average football program, forty six and forty four, I believe, over five hundred uh, since Colt McCoy's injury. And I want to say, so they, I think Texas is like seventy one and nineteen or something. Uh, the 90 yeah. games prior to Cole McCoy's injury and 90 games after their 46 and 44. Richard Justice, I think, threw the stat out there. My point being, somebody who's watching this, and I'm, I, I, I feel myself repeating the same damn things that I was saying yeah. like five, six years ago. I'm yep, like, yep. But that was um, when Mac was on campus, and we're still talking about guys can't tackle? You know what I mean? Like, what's, I don't know, man. I think something systemic is, is still going on in the program. We're just talking about the symptoms of it. But there's something bigger happening with this program. Like, it's lacking. Yeah. There's something missing. Like, those guys out there are athletic, but they don't have it. Like, they don't. They're not. Yeah. They don't have the edge. No. It's something. Man, I'm like, what the? I don't get it. They don't even know how to win. Like, I don't understand. Even guys like Connor Williams and Malik Jefferson end up getting infected by it at times. And we know those guys are yeah, NFL like players. Yeah, it's like back-to-back holding plays. In yeah. He was, like, graded out better than anybody I don't know what it is right I want to stick with the offense, but to, to, yeah. to the defense, because, Rod, I did the same thing. And and we'll go through it, and I think some of these issues are fixable. I know you talk about, well, it's fixable. Yeah. Some of these issues are fixable, and there are some – Maybe concerns that we had in the back of our heads that I think are real problems for this football team. Yeah. But we'll get to those in a minute. But with the defense, it's some of the stuff that I, when I went back and watched the game again, because you know, you guys know when when you're in the press box, you don't really get to watch the game. You get yeah, you, kind yeah. of bits and pieces here yeah. and there. Going back and watching it, I found myself talking about the same stuff with Todd Orlando's defense that I was talking about with Manny, Manny Diaz. Diaz. <laughs> and by that, I mean either this coaching staff completely is coaching these guys on the wrong thing to do, or the guys on the field just have bad football like Hughes and can't do it. Can't do it. And that's yeah. what we talked about with Manny Diaz, right? We're back we're There's back to the we're back to the disconnect on defense again. And what it meant, what they have to do, bring in Greg Robinson and simplify everything. Not saying they're gonna bring in anybody, anybody yeah. else, but right. simplify things. Mm-hmm. Hell, even with Vance Bedford, remember that? Remember the old wristband thing? Yeah. That the guys apparently couldn't pick up the, the defense and so they had to get them wristbands to make sure that everybody knew exactly what they were uh, their responsibilities were. So yeah, I think you're right. It seems like we're going through this cycle. Yeah. And now I think we're back to it on defense. Rod, right? we're we're back to I heard you on your show today sticking with the defense talking about defensive backs having eye control issues they're our responsibility the guys are terrible i mean the, the third 19 the first Good drive boy. of the 2010 rice game they point out shocky brown's eyes in the backfield and yeah. then on a reverse on the very first drive yeah. of that one that i was watching this you morning. know i mean yeah third 19 that was chris, i mean chris boyd literally i can i see him playing off coverage now because i've watched it over and over again he's staring in the backfield yeah and his guy gives him a stem mm-hmm. an inside stem for about five yards Goes up, uh, runs about 10, and then to the corner. And he gets on the top of Chris Boyd. Chris Boyd actually goes, like, underneath and then ends up going around the guy um, to try to tackle him because he's so lost in the backfield. I'm like, I wonder at the beginning of that snap, what is he thinking to himself? Like, what is your thought process when the ball is snapped and you know what your responsibility is how can you end up lost in the backfield that, that often? Yeah, no, right? I, mean, I mean, it was set up a couple times when you saw a good runs, dives, and then it's the play, play action right over, the over top. there. Exactly. And, you know, we talked to all of our listeners have th- heard us just sort of throw out how we've seen the de-evolution of Texas fandom and how it had always been a hope-based fan base that had looked forward to the young guys coming in. And in Texas, you always thought we're going to win. And if you were a 10-win team, it was a losing season. But then how it evolved to becoming a fear-based 
base fan base where the players you actually now whenever somebody's out you're worried that the next yeah. replacement's just going to be worse well it sort of made me start thinking about this team and the locker room culture that they had been around too because there's still had always been when you were a young guy or something say from your era Rod there had been that hope and the players had had upperclassmen that had won even like say when you had the opening struggles when you were there you talked about you know after the Ricky year you still had veterans like Hampton you had yeah. Leonard Davis these guys Man, in the locker room that yeah. had at least had some success and then you at least when this losing streak started it was like oh 10 11 12 these guys you had those upperclassmen they're in there they can really you know keep that culture of winning or at least be it they have somebody in there that has to done it, it but around. then when you yeah. look at the record of the team now and you're down to last three seasons six and seven five and seven five and seven now the players literally it's almost as if they have that fear-based mentality or a lo- loser's mentality because it's all they know oh, as yeah. their but you're only what you are or of your environment and surroundings and your behavior you don't might not even know that it's developed from those circumstances but when everybody looks back at their childhood they realize what influenced them and mm-hmm. what these things so it may be even deeper than like you said on the existential level like you look at what the definition I wrote down habit because at first you had it was coach Herman talking about the team oh, I think well the main issue was they were just pressing or trying to be perfect or trying to be more reckless a habit quote is an acquired behavior pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary and when you think about this now the way that he's saying they're pressing or processing it maybe the pressure of the situation that you know that man we lose we can't win this we got to win this game we can't lose it's sort yeah. of like how you lost to Kansas in that game that you knew everything's on the line but it almost yep. makes you avalanche Tighten. in the bad direction yeah. and it doesn't fuel your motivation but the pressure and these are all different from every person all personalities 85 of them in the locker room you don't know which ones are those personality types or what but then whenever the whole locker room becomes used to one situation it may be able to make it yeah. just devolve in that re- I mean we talk about if you're a half second slower or a, p- a tenth of a second it turns a four or five or four six guy into a four seven four eight guy. That's how Maryland maybe looks faster than you because you are on your heels or you're diagnosing instead of reacting and just becoming confident. And confidence sort of is intertwined with those instincts if you have it. Yeah. And it just seems as if it it's just devolving to that fear mentality of the bad thing happening instead of having that not creeping into your conscience. Aside yeah. from the losing though, Rod, I want to I want to get with you on this because this is something that I noticed live and then when I watched watch the replay of the game, speaking defensively, it seemed like guys just, when in doubt, go back to bad habits. Yes, they do. Oh, yeah. And that's yeah. why their habits, it's something no that question. it's almost, that it's like, just rooted in I you. I know, I know Todd Orlando has taught these linebackers how to properly Feel engage like a blocker yeah. and disengage and how to take right the proper angles. And you see some of this, I'm like, especially, I don't like picking on individual guys, but... There were some angles Anthony Wheeler took to the football that I'm like, where where on earth were you coached to do that? Yeah, you weren't coached to do that. Yeah, you're just you're guessing, and that's that's what I put on the players is. You're, I think you, the coaches didn't do the players very many favors in this game, especially defensively in terms of how they were set up and what they were asked to do. But the players didn't do themselves any favor because on especially on some of those third down packages, look like guys were just guessing. I agree with that. Yeah, it looks like the guys, and maybe Maryland, like I said, Maryland did a good job. They, their game plan offensively. DJ Durkin's staff won the chess match with Tom Herman's staff. No question. I mean, I love what they did uh, offensively. They started using, you know, 20 personnel, two backs in the backfield, split backs with the shotgun, you know a what lot they of ran, misdirection. Right? Yeah, you know what they ran? Yeah. It was a triple option. Yeah. It was just from the shotgun. It was just from the shotgun to split back. But it mixed the linebackers up. The linebackers kept misdiagnosing the plays <laughs> and running to the wrong gaps. That happened on offense, too. Offensive line had a lot of just misdiagnosis, and yeah. there's a free runner coming. Exactly. That so cross buck action in the backfield, man. I mean, it's it's like it's going like simple high school offenses. Like, it, mm. it really is because you see it like, oh, it's shotgun spread. No, man, it's like teams running the slot T, and you yeah. got cross buck action. you got backs going all different directions, and, yeah, it messes you up. If you start guessing instead of reading your instead keys. Instead of reading the keys, exactly. Like, coaches aren't stupid. They, they're they telling you your keys for a reason. Yeah. They're because that's, that that, that's going to help you make the play. Yeah. But when you start guessing and, and anticipating and just not paying attention and, you know, we'll get into, like, your will to win maybe waivers a little bit. And you you do start pressing, 
it's just guys just went back to bad habits. But like yeah. you said, Rod, not I'm sorry for cutting you no, off, but I do I did love what Maryland did. They dished they the tight end man. at one point. They just did twenty yeah. personnel. It's like we're just gonna go triple option. Then they brought the tight end back, made him an eight H back, like yeah. a flex tight end. So they would still run like twenty personnel, but he'd be flex and they had the run running back in the backfield with the shotgun. They still do some misdirection, sometimes pull him around as a blocker. Dude, they really I, I thought it was a great game plan, and I, I can see why it took Tyler Orlando. Well, he didn't, he never really found a, you know a, a remedy to it. He never really adjusted to it successfully. So I could see why he had trouble against that Maryland uh, offensive scheme. What worries me is uh, Maryland didn't have that many offensive playmakers. Yeah. You know what I mean? They found a good way to identify their playmakers and get the football to them. DJ Moore on the outside, uh, Ty Johnson in the backfield, Pegram, and even when they brought in uh, Kasim Hill, mm-hmm. he was essentially the same skill set. So they were able to keep the same philosophy. But we knew the three guys they were going to try to feature. Yeah. And it's like you let those three guys – not only beat you, but you, that's drafts. If those guys get drafted, mm-hmm. that's going to be like take- most of their draft film right there, like with the highlights and stuff. It's because you let the one, the two guys, Ty Johnson and DJ Moore, that you had to shut down and that you had to try to find a way to euthanize, if you will, and you let them have almost career games against you. So yeah. that, to me, was disappointing because that means, just like Vance, remember Vance, we said that about the yeah. Cal game. When he allowed the the Cal receiver, his name escapes me right Hansen. now. Chad Hanson. thank you. Who, you, every, you don't forget stuff. Yeah, like he's that. on the Jets now. He, yes. that, that's and everybody tape. knew, like, oh, well, what are they going to try to do? What are they going to try to get the ball to Hanson? He's their best player. They're going to try to get the ball to him. In in crucial situations, third down, you got to watch that guy. And that guy had a career day against Vance Beverly. He was like, well, that was the one guy who couldn't have the career day. You could have <laughs> shut down that one guy and forced him to beat you left handed. And with Maryland, that's worse me because in the Big 12, that is key. All right, because yeah. Big 12 offenses know how to get their playmakers of football as well as any offensive culture in the country. And we couldn't stop Maryland from getting the ball to DJ Moore and Don they, Johnson. They never, they never dared Tyro Pigram to throw the football. Yeah. It was they all did, built off they, that There time. was no effort to make Maryland one-dimensional, Rod. I agree with that. They gave them the whole playbook, the whole game. And the exotic blitzes. Or as Matt called them, erotic blitzes. The erotic, erotic, blitzes. The erotic. Well, they were erotic a little bit. Yeah, the erotic, mm-hmm. exotic blitzes of Tyrendo. It just worked to get guys out of position a lot of time, which lets me know those guys don't really know what they're supposed to be doing on every given uh, play. The, the two third downs that they I were talked out of position about. position a lot. The two third downs that I talked about, that was the two egregious blitz mistakes that I saw. The first one, and Rod, I'll show you a picture of it because I, sc- I had to <laughs> screen grab it. That much I frustration. Could, I couldn't believe it. This was the alignment on. This is a third and seven in the second quarter. And Pigram, show the camera too. And Pigram goes for 19 yards. Now, I want you to look at that alignment with John Bonney playing what I assume is a loose seven technique right there. Um, Puna, Ford, Puna Ford over the ball. And I think Ford, uh, no, Puna Ford's kind of shaded to the right shoulder of the center there. Uh, Anthony Wheeler's shaded to the left shoulder of the center. Interesting. You've got Breck and Hager on the outside shoulder of the tackle. Malik Jefferson's kind of playing off of Hager's butt. You've got Jeffrey McCulloch on the field side hash stacked with the nickelback. So I don't know exactly what you were doing there. It's exotic. And It's exotic. Though. But the blitz execution, Hager and Jefferson kind of go to the same spot, and it looks like Hager's – actually, Hager, Hager, Jefferson, and McCulloch go to the same spot. Yeah. And Hager tries to peel off and cross the tackle's face, and he kind of does, but – it becomes a real easy pin for the right guard. Mm-hmm. And all Pilgrim does is stick a foot in the ground and runs where there's really nobody, nobody. except the umpire, who's the only guy who yeah. can make a play. Yeah. And guess what? The umpire can't make a tackle for you. Sorry, he yeah. just can't. <laughs> um, but that's that's what you, you can got. get lucky. And that, was a, th- a that was a third and seven, and that was your call. And then Maryland scores on the next play. And the design of the blitz on the third and 19, the design was much better. But, yeah. the, but the execution, Rod, it's like – Man, when you blitz, you gotta move. You gotta drive home to your players. When you're coming, you gotta come screaming off that corner you like your ass is on fire. Get home, like We're, your yeah. ass is on fire. You're, you're leaving all of your other teammates out to dry if you don't hit that blitz. Like yeah, like with a serious sense of urgency. You know what I mean? It was yeah, a, I agree. It was you were you had an overload blitz and somehow the quarterback had a clean pocket to throw the football. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And it's, uh, to me, I think he's got to go back to kind of simplifying things. Just I love the exotic blitz looks because I know they really do kind of discombobulate quarterbacks. 
But man, if your guys just can't execute, if 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 you, if you have to go back just putting him exactly where he's supposed to be pre-snap with no kind of pre-snap uh, movement and you're not trying to confuse the quarterback pre-snap, you might have to go back to that and just, you know, go back to the most vanilla coverages yeah. and the most vanilla uh, looks you can get. Hold and, on, Matt. Hold on a sec. There was one clean blitz. I want everybody to go see if you can find it. Um, yes. This was the play right mm-hmm. before – it was a third wow. down. It was a three and out by the defense in the third quarter. And it was right before Reggie Hemphill scores on the punt return. Mm-hmm. And let me give you guys the situation because I wrote it out. This is a third and ten for Maryland. Uh, let's see here. Hold on just a second. Okay, yes, it's a third and ten at the minus 40. Uh, Texas goes dime personnel. Puna Ford's a down lineman. Brecken Hager and Jeffrey McCulloch are stand-up ends. It's against mm. an empty set. You got twins to the boundary side. Nice. Uh, corner Chris Boyd's playing about 10 yards off. Both John Bonney and Malik Jefferson are lined up on the field side between the hash and the numbers. Anthony Wheeler is in the middle. Uh, he and Puna Ford kind of do a loop stunt. Uh, blitzing. Jeffrey McCulloch hits the A gap. Malik Jefferson hits the C gap. John Bonney hits the B gap. All gaps are accounted for. The pressure got there. Pigram makes the only throw he can, which on the field side, you had trips. Oh. You had two verticals yeah. and the slot coming on out. The out was the only throw he had. He throws it. Holton Hill does a great job. Peels off his man. Makes a great open field tackle. Boom. They're short of the sticks. They got a punt. That's what those things are supposed to look like. Yeah. More often than not, if you're doing them right, that was just the only one I saw them get right. Really, all day, Rod. That was the by far the best third down look, the best exotic look, and the best result they had all day. And I, I wonder how much of it is new system guys just don't know the system uh, or not comfortable yet. They may know it, but they're not comfortable yet in the system, and they're still as as Matt points out, they're reading, diagnosing more so than reacting. Uh, because it's, it's all new to them. I'm hoping that is the case. If that's the case, they'll get. I hope get, so too. There'll yeah. be exponential improvement. But we've we've been here before, new DCs <laughs> in the past, and said the same thing and saw very little improvement. I'm I'm just surprised that you know the defense because of all the veterans on the defense and all the experience that they weren't the ones. And we kept hearing the defense is ahead of the offense. Defense dominated this scrimmage. Well, I think we know Defense why now, don't scrimmage. we? Well, yeah, we know yeah, the now. The offense is impotent. I think we got some evidence. Yeah, well, exactly. I think that, yeah, you're right. They were, it's kind of a false. Somebody's got to win if they're both bad. Yeah, it's a false perception. Yeah. By the way, can I just add this? It's sort of offense. like, and this is just like what uh, we heard from Mac before the 2010 season about that defense dominating, and it was more so that that defense was dominating a, bad a very bad offense because we heard yeah. that exact same and he, thing. He, and he did say the offensive line and defensive line were the strengths, I believe, of the uh, team. Oh, don't yeah. mind and, and and no, it goes to your point. Maybe yep. because they were both bad. Not yep. actually. Maybe, maybe they're the weakest parts of your team. Teams and they just get that's just, really bad for I mean? the offensive and just line. Really then. bad. Like that could just, that could be the case. Yes. Like, and I, then like when you talk about, uh, yeah, I think it was Herman who even volunteered this info at the very beginning of the press conference today. But he said that he thinks this is the brightest group of kids he's ever been around. So if that is the case, you would think that, like you said, they could easily remedy these issues uh, and easily could maybe pick up the system but it also I think if they're that bright it can also cause an overthinking of a situation that may be causing you to be a little more hesitant because you're trying to make sure you're perfect and you mess up already because you can't think there's out something there like to that, that Rod because you as long as you played this game yeah you probably played with guys that book smart they were awesome they were yeah. off the charts no question you know Tons graduated up. magna cum laude or yeah. whatever mm-hmm. just honor roll students yeah. honor students whatever but the guys that their brain works way too fast, and you're like, quit thinking. Oh, the yeah. perfect example is like react. the book Money Just react. Go. Yeah. You listen to but Billy Agreed. Bean, the number one overall, <clears throat> excuse me, number one overall draft pick, the basis of the book Moneyball. He's a guy that has all the skills and everything, and then his roommate Lenny Dykstra, the biggest meathead ever that just yeah. cares about partying and playing ball, and he's sitting there wondering why you're reading those damn books, but the big downfall for Billy Bean was his own mind. He couldn't yeah, get out too, of himself, yeah. and somebody like Dykstra is great because he just goes through, and whenever I was – 
theorizing about this the other night. It was while I was watching Hook, Line, and Stuttered, and it was Casey and B.Y. out there fishing with Ken Milam. And if you talk about those guys, they're guys that you aren't going to overthink it. They're going to go out there because they're going to kick your butt, and we're going to play football because we're Very football. True. And if you never had your confidence questioned, there's no reason to have it waver. But now we're at with these players who maybe have had some confidence questioned, and it may be overthought in that situation. I, yeah, I, I do wonder if he's going to be able to get the guys to buy in. That's a question now. It's seriously a question. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's let's yeah, because you had that whole not our guy hold, type coach. Yeah. Hold that thought real quick, Rod. I just want to mention in terms of being analytical and overthinking things that we've used the word erotic, <laughs> euthanize, and what was the one we just used? <laughs> <I don't, laughs> either way, I'm overthinking yeah. it using those things. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is very true. Yeah. Well, so yeah, so yeah, we've used uh, <laughs> we've used some colorful language here on the blitz so far. I think you meant neutralize, Rod, not euthanize. That's I didn't. I didn't catch up on that one. You picked up on yeah, that you, one. Well, yeah. I, I, I mean, I yeah. guess you want to euthanize the backfield. No, my whole thing. <laughs> if we're talking about that, my favorite neutralize one of these that I've ever heard. Neutralize. More apt. Yeah. So euthanize. I was watching. Uh, I was just sitting here thinking. I was like, euthanize, Rod B. That's pretty harsh, man. <laughs> We go, we're going there, huh? We're going there in game one. We still, oh, we still right. got 11 of these and hopefully a bowl <laughs> left, Rod. One of my favorite. It's not, it's not that depressing yet. Let's wait, till, let's wait till Red River before we start. Right, talk about uh, euthanized. Yeah, I think yeah. it was Luther Campbell on the U said that the uh, the people were trying to castrate him and keep his words yeah. out of his mouth. And it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were. You yeah, know. Yeah, they're trying to castrate him. Who knows? They're castrating me. Maybe some people watching Game of Thrones and trying to get some ideas. There you go. Um, mm-hmm. But, Rod, seriously, this is the ultimate and we'll look at both is i want to look at glass half empty today and i want to look at glass half full this is the ultimate pessimistic view that you could take right here is what i'm about to say does tom herman run the risk of guys in the locker room saying you know you told us things were going to be different this is going to be a new day and all this was going to change and come out here and get the same results don't none of this mean anything that that's my concern only because and I, I, think, I know Tom Herman's a master motivator. I know motivational psychology uh, is big from that Urban Meyer tree. Uh, so I, I have no doubt that you know Tom Herman's got a game plan and, and he's going to try to get these guys, kind of get their confidence back and their swagger back. My concern is that the buy-in is, is something that is going to be sold, if you will. The, it'll be sold by the, the leaders on the team. Like Tom Herman can go up there and talk all he wants. But the leaders on the team are going to get the rest of the club to buy in. It's going to be, you know, whoever the leaders are. And that's my concern is that I don't know the leaders are on this team. Yeah. Here's, here's my next point, though. You know I'm I mean? glad you went there because I was going to go there at some point. We'll go there right now. When guys like – and I think I think Puna Ford played hard. Puna Ford played hard. Mm-hmm. But Nate Sean Hughes is a guy that doesn't make a lot of plays. You know, Connor Williams didn't have his best game. I'm not saying Connor Williams doesn't have clout in the locker room because I believe he clearly does. Oh, of course, yeah, but he didn't have a great game. But at what point do your players, do your veteran guys, do their words not mean anything? Because at what point do guys start looking around like, why are you telling me to be accountable? Why don't you go out there and make a play? Can't be a leader if you're not playing well. Doesn't that happen, Rodney? Can't be a leader if you're not playing well. It's impossible because you can't hold others accountable and call them out when you yourself are not playing up to a certain level and a certain mm-hmm. standard. So that's the concern for me. Now it's a vicious cycle because if Connor Williams ain't playing well and P.J. Locke's not playing well, he didn't have his game, his best game, and Malik Jefferson's not stepping up and, you know, playing uh, to a all-conference level, then – they can't. They can't. They can't call anybody out. They got to focus on uplifting their own play and yeah, uh, right. taking their own game to the next level. But then you don't have anybody that is holding the team accountable and that is implementing the culture of Tom Herman at on the field and in the locker rooms. And right now, that's what you need. You need those guys to help get everybody yeah. bought into this culture. Because I can tell you right now, there are a lot of guys, as Matt pointed out, they've never won before. It's a so, vicious cycle right yeah, now because so you're at that tipping point that yeah. there's nobody that if, unless you have Nobody's somebody. Nobody's won there. Almost with that, what, the what, what, false enthusiasm is what Kwame Cavill was something that was always needed yeah. to go and be a wide receiver. You're going to have to have somebody with that false enthusiasm maybe in this situation because, yeah, if there aren't leaders or if, say, your guy like Connor isn't playing as well or situation, I mean, you look around, you don't have many upperclassmen. We were talking about this two years ago or a year and a half ago when all these guys that were looking to be 
three budding stars as freshmen, sophomores, you could tell that they wanted to become leaders, but then the older group, there was maybe a shift or a rift between the yeah. two, and it never did. That's why, at least now when you look at it, you have a few guys like Armani Foreman's been there since the beginning. He's a guy who scored in that game, a type of guy that may be able to get something like that. You look yeah, around, like, like be- you said, Puna, if he has it, a Connor Williams, a guy – Players that have been around for a while that if they can put together a handful of games, be those type of guys. But then it's all then about the individual. We don't even know who is the individual players with the leadership skills or the traits. Some people just aren't vocal like that. Some people take leadership different ways. So it's just a vicious cycle whenever you can point and say, yeah, but if y'all have all lost and y'all all aren't playing well, it's easy to say we probably don't have a leader standing out of the group. That That's, that's, that's scary mm-hmm. right now because that's what they need. The, yeah. This is the ultimate glass half full look at the program. Um, because what I was going to say, Rod, is when you talk about leaders <laughs> or your guys that play well, back when you were a young pup on the 40, back in my how many day. bad games Casey Hampton have? <laughs> uh, not many. How many bad How remember. many bad days did Aaron Humphrey have? Not many that I can remember. I'm sure there were a, a, a few. How many bad days C-Red have? Not a lot, man. See, in their own minds, they probably think they had some, mm. though. Oh, yeah. They, would, they, they <laughs> could that's probably that, that's recite that them. I can tell you all of my bad games, too. But, yeah, you know, we had those guys, Hodges Mitchell and Major Applewhite. There were just guys around there when we lost that game to NC State. But this goes, this goes back to what Matt's talking about, about the losing mentality and then that needing to change with your leaders. Your leaders have to be guys that when stuff goes bad, they don't panic. They don't flinch. Yeah, and they play well, even yeah. though the team's not playing well. And that's a thing that is all individualized because you could even have just a personality trait that maybe this group of guys is a higher, little higher of a ratio of those people in the locker room. I know that the first time I go on radio back in the day, I was panicked, worrying. You know, you feel your heart beating, you're going 100 miles an hour, yeah. but then you get used to stuff over time. But when you think about if you're – individually every year with 85 new kids you don't know those personalities and which ones true. and they it's even hard to hear because they may not even admit it to you if you have an issue with dealing with pressure and some people thrive on it they only excel because they're in front of everybody it's just different so maybe this i mean i have no mm. clue and this is something that nobody could tell but maybe this group of kids just has more of those than say other groups that maybe didn't have kids that are affected that way by it yeah Oh, no. I want to I want to talk defense though in terms of let's let's because I want to close with the offense and we'll close with Shane Bouchelle's shoulder injury and looking forward to San Jose State. But defensively, Rod, I think the things let's 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 go with bad and let's start going to good. Let's give, let's kind of start to wrap up the bad. Okay. Um, there are certain things with My this bad. defense that I don't think are going to get fixed. Um, you can't like I don't think I I agree with you there. A uh, man to man, being able to play man to man. They yes. can't play man to man. You can't play they zero just, coverage. And you can't be you can't teach them now all of a sudden how to play man to man. Like you don't learn it overnight. It's one of those things mm-hmm. you it's a skill you cultivate, craft you cultivate over yeah. time, and you become a great man to man coverage corner. And I thought you would start seeing that that incremental or even hell, I thought it would be exponential, but progress with these guys and their coverage skills. They can't cover man to man. If you can't cover man to man, you're going to have a long, long season because the Big 12, it, the only way to stop offense in the Big 12, you've got to be able to cover man-to-man You're going to have to go zero or cover one at some point. And, and these guys are exposed every time. Yeah. So, yeah. so that I don't think is going to change. Can't fix that. The other thing that I don't think is going to change, and, and Rod, we talked about the central nervous system and its defense and how you know with veteran guys it should be better. Mm-hmm. As hard as Puna Ford plays, and as much as everybody likes him, Puna Ford's an easy guy to like. I think him and Chris Nelson are just guys. Yeah. I don't says. think they're special all American type mm. guys with NFL ceilings. Agreed. I think they're just guys. Agreed. And the conversation, the question that I've gotten asked a lot since the game is you can't sit there and tell me that U of H has more talent than Texas. I said, man for man, maybe not. But let me ask you this if you're looking at two defenses and comparing last year's U of yeah. H defense to this Texas True. defense. Ed Oliver. Tell me any two guys on the Texas front seven right now yeah. that could wear Ed Oliver's or Tyus Bowser's jock. No. Name me any two guys in the front seven for Texas that could right now. Nobody. Not a one. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a harsh reality, man. Well, and that's at least true. with them, Ed Oliver, that's like a top guy in the nation. Mm. But Texas, that's where you had got those guys. U of H hadn't got those guys in decades past. This is one of those issues. This goes back to the end of Max tenure. This is many, 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 many years of missing on big-time defensive tackles. Yeah. 
and either you haven't gotten them or you've gotten them and they haven't panned out. out. Yeah. Jordan Elliott was the closest thing this program was going to have to Ed Oliver. Lost and honestly, if he hit his ceiling, I thought there is a chance he could get pretty damn close. I'm talking top 20 type NFL draft pick potential Jordan Elliott has. He's not here anymore. Now he's in Missouri. Marcel Southall was a guy that, talking to people who know this stuff and been doing it a lot longer than I have, felt like Marcel Southall could at one point be an NFL player. Yeah. He's not here right now. He's at, I believe, Cisco Junior College. If you don't have studs up front, you're going to have a tough time stopping people. And not to say that Texas is going to be incapable of stopping people against the run, but I think this Maryland game was a a, a splash of cold water in the face. To me it was, and a wake-up call saying, you know, as much as I – and I'll put it on myself. As much as I drink the Kool-Aid on this defensive line being better – you don't just go from being just guys to be having NFL type season. I think Texas of the guys that play regularly, and I'm not counting the newcomers because I don't know. That's one game and not a lot of plays to sample to to get that kind of a high arcing take on Taquan Graham or Jamari Chisholm or any of those guys that play. Yeah. But of the regulars, I think there's two guys that I look at and I say that guy's got a chance to play in the NFL, and it's Charles Amendola and Malcolm Rhodes, guys that play the same position. Yeah. None of your interior defensive linemen right now, of your veteran guys, and really you've only got two with Ford and Nelson. Rod, those that's not Casey Hampton, Sean Rogers. It's not even – it's not Tubbs. It's not Rod Wright. It's not any of those guys that when this defense has been really good over the last two decades and they've had that rock in the middle, I don't know if they've got that guy. I don't think they've got that guy. That's a good point. Uh, you, and that, was, that rock of Gibraltar, I was with Casey Hampton and Sean Rogers. Uh, Marcus Tubbs after that, yeah. um, and and there there is there. And the, it was Rod Wright, and then Roy Rod Miller, Wright. yeah, and then Lamar Houston, and then Keiston Randall, yeah, and then Malcolm Brown. Because if when you have at least one level, one unit on that defense that you can say is that you can kind of hang your hat on, like that, that you can create an identity with that. So if you had a great defensive line, then man, maybe we ha- are a uh, liability in the secondary, but they don't have to cover it for that long because our defensive line can get pressure on the quarterback. It can it can reset the line of scrimmage in the running game. And right now, I don't know what unit you start to build a game plan with in that on that defense that you can depend on. That's a trustworthy unit. Can't trust the guys in the back end to play man to man. You can't, can't trust the defensive you line. You can't trust the linebackers right now. Yeah, as I'm saying. So er, there's no. What do you start? You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't you can't protect the entire defense because then all of those safeguards are going to leave you. You're just going to be playing vanilla defense, and you're just going to get run. They're going to ram it down your throat, or they're going to you know dink and duck you the entire way. So I I, I think obviously there's an off- offensive identity crisis. We'll get to that, but defensively, I'm trying to see where they go from here, where the improvement yeah. starts. Like where do we start building building bridges? Where do we start? Like okay, well we can get better here. This is something that we can do and get better. Tom Herman says the number one thing they have to improve on from that game, like offense, defense, or special teams, is rush defense. Got to, because if you got a bad rush defense, dude, it, it doesn't matter. You're going to get killed. But if you're incapable of resetting the line of scrimmage with any level of consistency, Rod, how much better can you realistically get? You, but go, you brought up the other guys, the depth. Now, I, and I hate to do it this summer. Remember, Charlie had to do it. Uh, he's maybe started rotating defensive backs right mm-hmm. after that Cal game early in the season. And now, you know, after the first game of the season, you wouldn't think it would be that early for Tom Herman, but maybe on the defensive line versus San Jose State, who better? Yeah. To start seeing if somebody can play, you start throwing guys out there and getting them reps. I know it sounds crazy because I'm with you. I thought it was obvious who the best front line guys on that defensive line were going to be. It was going to be Malcolm Roach, uh, Charles Minnell, Puna Ford, Chris Nelson, and, you know, I don't necessarily know if all four of those guys are going to be, you know, two of those guys, you said play the same position, but I don't know two out of those three guys are not trustworthy enough or dependable enough. There was there was one, and I, I, I will say Puna Ford played hard. And, and, Puna and Ford, it, actually, I think he's, ser- he, he's, he's definitely serviceable, though. Yeah. I agree. You're talking about For standout. A uh, extraordinary player on the front, a guy future that, NFL player. A guy that when when I, when I'm an offensive coordinator and my GA gives me that scouting report Sunday morning, I say that says here yeah. it's got nine five and it's circled to be like we've got to block, we've got to block this guy. guy. 
I don't think there's going to be many OCs getting that report. I agree, Dylan. And that's why when you look at this line, if you don't have one of those guys, it maybe just shows you that your ceiling as a defense isn't very high. But if you are disciplined, just have your run fence, don't blow any assignments, you can still maybe be one of those top 40, top 50, just uh, serviceable defense that isn't going to get you beat. And if you ever want to become an elite one, you're going to have to get somebody on the front end. So that's why you can sort of look at this, obviously, and be like, all right, this defense isn't going to just get good overnight. It isn't going to immediately just show up and stop the Big 12. But as long as you don't mentally screw up and be able to take advantage of the situations when given the opportunity, you can be a serviceable defense. And in the Big 12, that's very good. That's above average to your field in the conference. So what you're talking about, Matt, is basically you've got to be – you got to kind of be what like TCU and Oklahoma State are on a pretty consistent basis. There there have been years where TCU yeah. and Oklahoma State have had dogs up front, and that's usually when those guys are really good on defense. Yes, but they're usually like you said, serviceable. Yes, do and, what Snyder does. But Get the, the just make sure that you go in because of the integrity of the defense. With one misassignment, it can be compromised if one person doesn't do their job. So that's going to be really where you're able to get now. Maybe it is a lot more because of Orlando did have some exotic or however we want to call it, blitzes, just schemes, things that are a little bit more advanced that they haven't picked up on yet. But once you're able to get the guys in there that get your system, it's like as long as you can keep that integrity of the defense and not have one exploitable hole whenever you make a mistake, just get the guys out there that actually get it. What's fixable on defense to me, Rod, is I think you can change the way – you can change your blitz packages, you can change your coverages, you can do some things schematically that – while it might not give you the wholesale aggressiveness that you ideally want, you can do some things to get by that can mask some of your deficiencies Mm -hmm. to an extent that can just make you not vulnerable every time you go out on the field. You can do what Maryland did. Yeah. It's Texas. Yeah, it's not ideal. You're still going to give up yards. You're still going to have issues. But but your playmakers, once they can kind of grasp the concepts and and your simplified concepts, hopefully, they'll play faster. Yeah, yeah, and that's where you'll start to get the improvement, and they'll play more confidently. And then instead, yeah. you'll at first you're basically trying to prevent explosives from happening, and then exactly. they get confident. Which then is, you can flip it on them and maybe get a defensive play that can be a turnover that's a defensive explosive going. That's the other exactly way. what Maryland did versus Texas. Mm-hmm. And here's the deal: it's maybe just, maybe Todd Orlando was overconfident in what this defense could do personnel. right out of the gate. And now maybe he had to go back in that staff meeting and say, you know what, Man. this, 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 and this, we got to take this well, out. You we heard gotta- during the press conference that he actually, Tom Herman actually said that in practice they were implementing it, and then it was odd to see that there was almost that buffering zone inside these kids' heads. It's like, no, you've never done that. You haven't done that all fall. Why are you doing that now? And it goes back to the habits and learned behavior. So if those are purged out, maybe there is that hope mm-hmm. that they can be that much better, but that's yeah. asking a lot. But what we're saying is why, some- why, even, why even run the risk of trying to purge it? It out just yeah. handle it yourself yeah. just change some of what you do for Very right true. now he, he's definitely got to change some things i mean that, that those guys at times looked lost and they were playing extremely slow uh and that's, yeah. not, that's what's they're, worrisome they're, when you look at some of the quotes that they're like no we're gonna do what we do and there's even when you look at the offense at times it just seemed like a square peg round holes type thing that it's like man right now you those long developing runs to the outside they really aren't working you aren't getting the blocking up front you got to go point a point b just get downhill and get some yardage that's what bothered me though rod defensively is everything just looked a half step slow they were, yeah, they, you could tell guys were they were reading a lot of plays took them a while to misdiagnose a lot of those plays filling yeah exactly right (laughs) filling the the wrong gaps taking stuff on with the wrong shoulder that there was there there are some things like just basics that are going to improve this because i saw a lot of guys just taking on blocks the wrong shoulder (laughs) but that's what Um, we were saying five years ago to the ball yep we were saying that five (laughs) years ago that's that is stuff that you actually can fix yep that will it'll 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 be in light and day on that defense it really will that's back to your existential like deep yeah, with the program. But, but when you get to um, Big 12 play, and it's going to happen with USC too, um, you will get exposed against like athletes. It's just, yeah. you know what I mean? Because you do need a, you do need a, a philosophical schematic advantage. Yeah. And that's what the scheme of mm-hmm. Tyler was supposed to give you, that yes. schematic advantage on top of, you know, your, 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 your Texas athletes. So I think that right now you may lose that schematic advantage. And, hell, Offensively, we thought we'd get a schematic advantage too, and that, you didn't seem to have one of those either. So. Well, I, I would love to sit here all day, but I guess we got to go ahead and get to offense based on where Let's we are it. at this point in the broadcast. But 
Rod, you talk about schematic advantage and, and what you just described about Todd Orlando. That kind of reminded me of back in the day Greg Davis offenses. Like oh. when you've got better personnel, you're just going to say my guy's going to go beat your guy and, and we'll have at it. But you lose a schematic advantage, yeah. like you said, when you're facing Which is like why athletes. Oklahoma would beat Greg Davis all right. the time. You know what I mean? So going to the offense, um, this goes back to something I said earlier. I watch this game, Rod. I can't tell you what this offensive scheme is. I can't. It doesn't look like a power spread. It's not it doesn't a pro look spread. like a spread. No. It's. I don't know what it is. It looks like, like I said. It looks like the 2010 Texas offense, where you're just kind of this mishmash of. Well, what are we doing this week? Yeah. We're gonna go five wide. We go empty the whole time. <laughs> throw it 60 times. Great. Yeah. No, like, I'm with you on that. I I was just trying to. I thought they would get into a rhythm. There was no rhythm to it. It seemed yeah, no so kind of arbitrary and just you kept waiting on, you know, oh, him to develop a rhythm with this receiver or see a certain set of plays or a concept of plays and go, oh, I see what they're working here. They, yeah. you, I was able to see that last year actually with Sterling Gilbert's offense. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, I see what he's working on here. I see the tent poles of the offense. I see the philosophical, like the concepts. I cannot tell you – what this offense is based on and built on and what they're trying to uh like what they're trying to take advantage of what they're trying to exploit defensively i couldn't re- I, I couldn't figure it out and come to find out after the game we, we know that tom herman they couldn't figure it out either. they were actually perplexed early on because maryland showed them some looks they weren't ready for. can i give you my theory on the offense saturday what? i think after the first drive where bouchel comes out and gets sacked on the first play which I'll get to Bouchelle in a second because I've got a different take than I think a lot of people have today or that some people have today. Bouchelle gets sacked, and they have a short run play, and then he throws the interception. Bouchelle. I, I think they panicked. I think they panicked, and whatever they planned on doing, they just ditched it, and that plan went out the window, and it was just kind of a mishmash of what's going to work on – what do we think is going to work on this drive? That, okay, two things then well, – more than two things. If that is true, let's say that is true – Man, hold, they, that, hold that thought, Rod. Hold that thought. Okay. Before you do that, the one thing that the one negative I've heard on Tim Beck, and well, I've heard, heard a lot of negatives, but as a play caller, yeah, is and this is from people that knew him at Kansas and that knew him at Nebraska, said if he could, he would throw the ball every play if he wanted mm-hmm. to. Like okay. Tim Beck loves throwing the ball, hmm. so I, I just want it. that, just want that out there and in everybody's mind. So Rod, that was a knock on him, and it looks like when, when in doubt, they just reverted um, to just. Chuck it around the field. So, Rod, go ahead. That ratio, uh, habits learn behavior if that's what you're used to. And that's what he falls back on. Go ahead with me. I'm sorry, Rod. No, you just blew my mind with this theory because if that is true, man, how quickly they abandoned their game plan. And that's against what Herman said because he said, quote, we aren't changing. Like when asked that same question in the press conference, he would totally disagree with that. That doesn't mean that that isn't what happened. But he was saying that, no, we're no, going to no. keep it aligned. So maybe that's a rift between the, the two. I take the press theory, conference quotes with a big grain of salt. I agree totally. That's my theory. The theory I think holds they water because let's say, because if it wasn't true, then let's just say that it, it, that it wasn't true and that they, they stuck with the game plan as long as they could. It's almost an indictment either way. Yeah. No, it is. If that, Either sucked right? or if that was the actual game plan that you came out with against Maryland, exactly. So this is so a good case hoping, scenario. Yes, I think your theory actually may be a more optimistic view that yeah. okay, you know what? They just panicked. Yeah. First game, only fourteen they, rushes. No they, 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 exactly. Yeah. Because I would hate to think that the game plan initially, which we know is not much like Tom Herman, it's not his philosophy, yeah. that he would abandon the running game. Yeah. Um, and that, that does align sort of with, like, if you we were supposed to be a tempo-based offense and have this ability to hit quick, and you look at even a lot of those plays were long-developing plays. They did. Routes, and that would yeah. sort of go towards what Jeff's saying, trying to – Get back Trying what you're you're behind yeah. by twenty early. We're throwing the ball, and you can't see the way that the game just went to crap out of nowhere. At least you could understand back feeling as if he needed to throw more to get back in. Even though it's not a good idea, you should do what you got to do if you still got three quarters to yeah, go. It was too but early. at least indicates that that maybe was the case, and he was trying to get him back quicker. That's so why we're seeing longer routes that are going to be a little bit more time to develop. And then the tempo based offense didn't seem to be there. It looked like they were just trying to get the next play and figure out what to get in and run it. They didn't seem confident at any aspect of it. Rod, can I give you another uh, layer of my theory that I think might give hold it to some me. water? Tim Beck said in the spring when we met with him in the spring, he said the purest game he felt he ever called as a play caller was his last game at Nebraska because 
they knew they were fired and he had nothing to lose. Yep, hmm. no, nobody gets it. Yeah. Holiday Bowl against USC. Nebraska, Coach Fearless. Nebraska lost that game. Se- what, he threw it 70 times or 60 uh, times? If you look at Nebraska, <laughs> who had Amir Abdullah, Terrell Newby, uh, Tommy Armstrong, who's a running quarterback, yeah. Nebraska ran the ball 43 times in that game against SC. Would you like to know how many times Nebraska threw the ball? With Tommy Armstrong as your quarterback, how about 51 pass attempts? Yeah. Wow. For the purest game Tim Beck has ever called. Yeah. This is balanced. That's balanced there. Not bad. That's balanced. But with Tommy Armstrong as your oh, quarterback, yeah, that's you true. threw it 51 times. Yeah, that's a good point. And Amir with Abdul-Lin Tommy Ar- and I love Tommy. Yeah. Love that coaching staff at Cibolo still. But Tommy Armstrong is one of the last quarterbacks I want throwing the ball 51 times. No, I agree with you. Uh, it's, I, I don't know why um, they put so much on Shane Bouchel after – Clearly observing the offensive line couldn't pass block. That's why I thought that if your theory is right, they panicked, which is actually a good theory because that makes more sense. That's all I got right now. Why everything kind of why, – why they just threw the running game out the window. But when you figure out, oh, man, we can't really block these guys for some reason. Our offensive line is terrible, and they're holding. It was some holding calls that went – that did not get called either. A ton of them. I'm yeah. talking about Connor Williams too. Um, why not go back to the running game? Or go back to something to supplement the running game. The tight end is an issue too. Yeah. And nobody's talking about it, but with this new zone blocking scheme they're running, tight end is an issue, man. It's the another body well, out there needs to be able to per- be productive if you're going to use it as yeah. one of your eleven. Because the other offense was using their eleventh player as another offensive weapon, yeah. and they, they skewed the numbers. If you're conceding it on the other side and playing almost ten versus eleven, and it's not going to be a good success. Rod was exploited on numerous occasions. Rod, I don't think it's that they're a zone blocking team. I think they had to go to zone because the times they did try to run some counters. There was way too much penetration that they're like, screw that, we can't, we can't do that. Interesting. Okay. That ain't gonna work. Yeah. Because Tom Herman's sort of offense, like his own coverage. from you what can't I've do seen, man-to-man. it's a lot of ca- it's a lot Counts. of counters and powers and pulling guards and guys kicking down and you know you kick down block and you pull the guard what that little G they play. They not move anybody uh, off the line of scrimmage. I think that's because your so DBs they can't cover man to man. Your didn't have line co- can't win man to man. I think a lot line. of the issues on offense was a staff that panicked and just went with what they thought was best. Hmm. what they thought they could do to get by. That makes sense. Because none of what I saw looked like what I've seen from Tom Herman's offenses at U of H or Ohio yeah. State or anywhere else he's been. Very but true about that. If, and I, it, that's a good point because it, it kind of looked like that. Like It looked like they were freestyling out there. If that is the case and you can abandon your philosophy that quickly, and I give you credit for trying to you know, be malleable and you know, change it up and – you know, try to be evolve, all right, with whatever the game plan is. But man, I, I am I, I am flabbergasted then that he could not come up with something better. Number one, better on the fly. He's an offensive guru, and number two, that that's your that's supposed to be your bread and butter. Your your yeah. you're supposed to be able to teach that better than any other technique or yeah. any other philosophy. And you couldn't teach that to these guys, and it, it and you blew it up. Uh, within I don't know two quarters basically of bad football, yeah that's that's cause for concern. That Either just, way, it's tw- cause for concern. Just sort of popped in my head to think about it now. But what's the one thing sort of missed? Because you're talking about you know in the time of the moment with that offense, and it didn't look anything like a Tom Herman offense that we know of the last two years. That. Well, I agree. With the one that thing that missing the though that was the other part of that head of that offense was Major Applewhite, who was a guy that. He's aligned with football. He knows, and in the moment, I assume that he's going to be able to process and get out. And, I mean, he'd been doing it as a quarterback under like under duress, and then he's not with this team there to where I don't even know how much that component worked because they're all together with Herman, Beck, and Applewhite the last couple of years. And so, then even at Ohio State, it's, it's Tom Herman's. It didn't look like he, that Tom Herman offense, fully him. but it's still Urban Myers' yeah. offense. So, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, this I is hadn't the first thought about time it until it's you Tom started. Herman's offense without either of those elements. You're right. And my only point. thing to dissect was, well, good what's point. missing to make it not look like that? And it's like, Urban well, Myers major is missing. Major <laughs> so we'll see. That's um, a great point, man. That Now you just freaked me out. Even more. Now, well, because like, we don't, and that's a good hell. thing. It's one game. We don't know, and that's where the longer sample size will play out. But while we're sitting here trying to theorize, we're throwing every right. possibility out there because you have to figure out something going forward. It just would be we can't just turn off the show we, and say, all right, had, well, next week, let's go. We, we've had the holy S moments with offensive coordinators around here. For, for Brian, remember for Brian Harson, I remember it vividly. It was, the, it was the OU game. 
Yeah, it was the OU game where we're like, "Oh man!" And yes, the, the Kansas game. Kansas I'm, game. Yeah, I told myself I'm not going to go there. It's a five year anniversary this fall. Don't remind me, please. And we're don't, back to the same issue. I show. love that. Now that is the Kansas game. And hey, and you know year. who was a part of that? Like, the major Applewhite was on that one. Which <laughs> bad Kansas game are we talking about? Sis, the one we <laughs> lost. That's the bad one. That's the oh worst yeah. One. yeah, yeah. The one we win. The is old a good one used to be the bad one. Yeah, I'm worried about Kansas this year for real. I'm worried again. I'm freaking out now. <laughs> okay. So, I want to talk about Shane Happy Bouchelle now. real quick. Oh, yeah. Matt, well, how much time we got left, Matt? Oh, uh, we, we can keep on going, man. We can okay. Go. We got about, what, probably 10 minutes left or so? That'll work. 20, I don't know. Whatever we decide. We got time. There's no traffic. It's Labor Day. Um, So, I want to talk about Shane Bouchelle from this standpoint. Oh, man. If uh, and, and you guys can disagree with me. This is the fun of this show. Rod, we could have a Duke Thomas debate all over well, again. I think I can get it to Rod Hurd. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm about to get into this. Yeah. It's about to happen. I, if I and I've got, it. I've got to make the Texas ten the list of the top ten players, and I might do a top five, bottom five, given how bad this game was. But if I'm making a list of the best players in this game, Shane Bouchelle is my number one because I think, considering the circumstances, considering you, he, well, I don't care if it was design runs or scrambles or whatever, he was your leading ball carrier with 15 carries. I know. He was crazy. sacked five times. Yeah. He threw it 53 times and just kept coming back and coming back. And in person, I felt this way. Watching after the game, I felt it even more. I can almost live with the bad stuff he did because the stuff he did to keep this team in the game, even when I didn't know what they were doing offensively, I thought Shane Bouchelle was the reason that this offense scored and the reason Texas didn't lose this game by 20 or 30 instead of 10. Yeah, I think the criticism against Shane Bouchelle is, is unfair. Um, I think the coaches put him in a really tough position by you know pretty much abandoning the running game and putting the entire game in on his shoulder. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no pun intended there. I know he's got the shoulder injury. And he might have played the whole thing with the shoulder because he got yeah, pissed up on that first exactly. drive into the ground. So I'm not sure how long he played with it. That's I, a really well, good I'm point. convinced he played the whole Cal game last year with a concussion, but that's uh, well, maybe something else. That. So he, no, he's tough. I, I love yeah. Shane Bouchard. I think he's great. I know a lot of people are wondering about the, you know, the dual threat element. We know Tom Harmon can say it all well, he wants. But oh. here's the thing that aggravates me about that. Why are people just now realizing that Shane Bouchelle is not a fit for Tom Herman's office? I knew that when he was hired in November. No, there's, I, I think a lot of people knew that. I think a lot of people knew that. Why are that? people just like, well, you don't have a dual-threat quarterback? Really? Because I could have told you during the first spring practice that Shane Bouchelle is not a dual-threat quarterback that can run the offense. He has functional Tom mobility. Herman. Exactly. Yeah, which he can move around, but he just, and he's too slight. For you to, for him to be running that much, this is why this yeah. is the this is the downside of having him run as many times. He as He looks did. like redshirt freshman Colt McCoy because yeah, he, he's in his second exactly. year. It's that this same shouldn't thing. be some big revelation. Oh my God, Shane Bouchelle's not a fit in the offense. People, you should have thought about that in November. No, no, no. I think people evident. did. I yeah. did. This is why I I was preaching I think he's still just that Gerard Hurd should not be a wide receiver. I I thought it was an irresponsible decision then. It's an it's an irresponsible decision if they leave him there now. He should have been at wide receiver. As so he should have been. Pulled from wide receiver and put at quarterback as soon as Tom Herman got on the 40 acres because you needed quarterback depth. And not only that, we just know skill set wise that there's more synchronicity, if you will, between the Tom Herman philosophy and the skill set of a Gerard Hurd, a true dual threat quarterback. Even though he may not be uh, experienced and in, in, I would say at adept at reading defenses, but, you know, and Sam Ellinger, more of a dual threat quarterback. And yeah, you got to have the freshman growing pains with him. But those guys fit Tom Herman's scheme better than Shane Bouchelle. That's because Tom Herman, based on his history with quarterbacks, he likes dual threat quarterbacks. His offenses are most successful with a dynamic element, uh, running element at the quarterback position. I refuse to believe. Here's what I refuse to believe. And, Rod, we talked about this last week, that Tom Herman just went into this blind without looking at the, the possibility of could we move Gerard Hurd to quarterback and what would that look like? It was like? irresponsible. No, I, I agree with Rod just on the idea that you know how much that quarterback position is needed to win in just the game of modern football, not to mention so the you're big saying So well, you're saying he didn't look at it? Well, no, no, that he did look at it. I just think that he maybe didn't fully weigh the idea that the depth needed at one when you have ten guys exactly. here and you don't have three here. Yeah. And even though he may be worse off than Ellinger and Bouchel right now, it's still worth having because us as Texas fans in this fear-based mentality know that you need three quarterbacks because we've had three before and you don't have any. So I at least can see. But then we don't we weren't there. So if he isn't performing well, it could also indicate as to why he moved him back 
two wide receiver, but it's still that he better have a quick gauge on that backup quarterback role sure. and be able to adapt to it. Otherwise, it's going to be a very bad decision if he isn't prepared. Gerard Hurd at this point is a boutique player. He is a wildcat quarterback. He's not going to give you. But he's like, our third quarterback. That's all. Um, that's, that, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a fact because okay, of, so of what your situation point. is. That's not like but, some big but revelation. That's, that's we talk about the third. fragility of the situation. You should have had him working quarterback. You don't need him at wide receiver. Scenario, I'm looking at him playing wide receiver. receiver. You're, he's not even out there that much playing wide receiver. Think, Rod, You're yeah, so I, deep there. I think they've yeah. already looked at it and said, you know what? The package Gerard Hurd could handle in this offense is so thin anyway that let's just give him those eight plays and whether he's a starting quarterback all of a sudden or just a specialty player, that's going to be the extent of what he can run. So you're no, saying and they just punted basically if it's not Bouchelle or Ellinger, we're going to suck, so they're only going to let him be the emergency third It's not. Quarterback. No, it's not saying that you can suck. I'm saying they probably looked at it and say, this is what he can handle within the mm-hmm. framework of the offense. This is what he can handle. That, let's say he that's can do true. this. Mm-hmm. Let's say that's true, and I, and I agree with you. My point was the transition to wide receiver is easy for him. He can do it in a month. Yeah. Any damn offense, it doesn't matter what offense it will be. He could do it in a month. He really could. So why are you wasting that? His, reps. His, why are you wasting like, valuable reps in the offseason at wide receiver when he could transition to wide receiver overnight? We all seen him do it. Because you know quarterback in a new system, as you pointed out, he's not really comfortable in that system. He's going to need more reps in a new system. So why not let him play quarterback now? Because – First game of the season, you already need him to now actually take quarterback reps. So those eight plays, why not let him perfect them? Why not just why you just gave it to him? You know, go play wide receiver. By the way, say these eight plays and make sure you know them for quarterback. Why not let him perfect w- those eight plays at quarterback so that when you need him, like you need him right now, like I told you you was gonna need him. Mm-hmm. I told you this, Tom. And everybody knew this. This was not some shock. If you study history on the 40 acres, I could have told you, you're going to need all them quarterbacks, bro. You're going to need every last one of them. Mm-hmm. Every last one. You're going to need them. We know this. Ever since 2010, 2011, yep. this has been the case. You won, a, you won a national title with your third string quarterback because of issues similar to this, Tom. Really? Because like, here, really? I think because here's why. Because I think they know. And look, here go, this goes back to the Sam Ellinger thing. Yes, I think Tom Herman loves Sam Ellinger. But you've had 15 practices with Shane Bouchelle and Sam Ellinger together. You've had all summer. You've had 29 practices through camp. Not once has Tom Herman wavered publicly on who his starting quarterback is. That's true. I think they know, Rod, whether we want to talk about Sam Ellinger or Gerard Hurd or the dual threat element or what. I think Tom Herman knows and this staff knows if Shane Bouchelle has to miss an extended amount of time, five, six, seven games, they know they are screwed and whatever they've got to do at quarterback to make it work, it's going to be patchwork and they're just going to be putting bubblegum patches on the Titanic. I, I don't disagree with anything you yep. said. My point was always prepare for the worst because Texas had really bad luck at quarterback lately, so just prepare for the worst. And just so happened, I'm knock on wood, I hope it ain't the worst, but it's only been one game. He ran the ball 15 times, and he's already hurt. Mm-hmm. Say what you want about Sam Ellinger. He's great. I'm knocking on wood. Hell, man, he got hurt in high school a ton. Yeah. So my point was, just prepare for the worst, Tom. Why would you do that? You don't need to. You don't need to run a wide receiver. I, remember what I said? If he's not an all-conference wide receiver, I was going to be pissed. He will yeah. not be an all-conference wide receiver. That's right now. Ain't, ain't, ain't no, ain't no, there's no question about it. He will not be because he's not playing enough right. to be an all conference wide receiver. And we don't have a go to guy. We're not going to have the kind of an offense. So you are wasting him, essentially, in my opinion, because he is more valuable as a third string backup quarterback, being ready, getting those reps, being in that meeting room, getting ready for that than he is at that wide receiver room. Guarantee you, he'd be worth more to Texas football at quarterback right now. I don't give a damn how company. You, and it, it, it kills me. Because Tyrell Pigrome is basically Gerard Hurd. Yeah. It kills me that. Yeah, actually, Texas, like, yeah, maybe yeah, not Texas as good. Like, well, he can, all he can do is he can only read a couple of defenses, and, and then he just throws a run to Billy. He's basically a running back at the quarterback position. So was Tyrell Pigrome. Colin Klein almost Can't, won a national championship for Kansas State. They're like number two in the nation. A, he exactly. literally couldn't throw the ball when he first took that had, had, a, had a great offensive game plan built around his skill set, his strengths, his weaknesses. Tyrell Pigrome came down here and looked like he would have had, a, uh, I think he had way better stats if he didn't slip and fall. Like four or five times yep. in the beginning yeah. of the game. Well, one scary thing about so that, why though, can't we do that with Gerard Hurd? 
Well, I I've heard I these coaches know. though say that. No, they no, no do I said, what I'm not saying. Do. I'm not saying no, I want to see that. I'm just saying if worse come to worse and you know fit mm-hmm. his to Shan, why can't Texas do that? And I, I agree totally. It just worries me when you think back to what these coaches have said. They like their system, do what they do, and they aren't going to waver from what they do on their offense. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't fit that. So maybe that's another reason why it's like I don't care if you can go out there and run the way Pigram ran. Heard is electric. We've seen Sean the Watson said the ends. same thing too. For the record, yeah. It's just I don't know. I I'm just mad about that. I'm sorry for yelling. I'm just mad about you that because I saw I saw this coming. The fans I are so angry. Been, they're throwing things. I've Everybody, seen we've we're seen this coming, we and I just can't believe that Tom Herman, all of his vision, did not see this coming. This was obvious. We've been talking about how slight Shane Bouchelle's frame is for a while, and that the last year we were talking about how he's going to deal with a lot of injuries and he's got to put on weight and he's got to avoid the big hits. Mm-hmm. And now, it all started was, with the quarterback getting hurt in the end of, of 2009. You know, I, I think it really did. Exactly. More history to study. And then on the what happened immediately? You had three quarterbacks, and you had one on. that only perfected. David Ash knew five plays, but he was going to run those five plays perfect as a freshman. I still understand. That was just the beginning of that. Stockpile quarterbacks, dude. You can never have enough. You never he's, have enough of he's, them. He's got two committed for 2018. Belichick and just traded another one. Yeah. You know, I'll. I, I, I'd like to think Shane Bouchel is going to play against San Jose State. I don't know if he should. Well, here's the thing that that worries me, and and I can't believe we're we're going down this road. If Bouchel doesn't play, okay, and Ellinger does play, okay, San Jose State, I think it's a terrible football team. Centaur. Oh, but you're saying true freshman quarterback, anything could happen. No, I'm saying what if Sam Ellinger goes and lights it up against a bad team? Good. And now oh, you've got false hope. Now you got the true now quarterback you've got controversy. False hope. Now yeah. you really do have a quarterback controversy we're right back on to your where doorstep we were in that you got to deal with. And now and he's definitely trying to avoid that. He doesn't want that. That's the last that's thing he what, can deal th- with. Now, yeah. why I said and I that's take, why he's not letting the well, hold on, speak. hold on. Good point. No, he, hold on. he doesn't want anything split. No, right hold on. Now. That's that's why. I, and I don't think Tim Beck would have said what he said about Shane Bouchelle last week about Shane being the guy and whatever if they weren't on the same page, but. This is why Tom Herman and, and why I, t- I said I take press conference quotes with a grain of salt, except when you really like read hear into it. When Tom Herman stands up there and says Shane Bouchelle is our starting quarterback, right? I think that's why in the back of his head, I think that's why he knows he wants Shane Bouchelle to play on Saturday. Yeah, that's a good point. You don't want a quarterback controversy because they got a lot of issues here, and quarterback controversies split locker rooms. Oh, they yeah. just and more than that, do more than that. Here's, here's the that. other reason why I don't think he wants to go to Sam Ellinger because it's fr- and Tom Herman mentioned it today. And I know I said I take press conference quotes with a grain of salt, but I've talked about two back-to-back things where I talk about quotes in a press conference. <laughs> he said he was asked about if this team is fragile in terms of the run game, if that's why they didn't run the ball. And he said mentally, yes, this is a fragile team. Yeah. yeah. If he starts Sam Ellinger yeah. and it goes bad, yeah. what happens to the psyche of this football team? Gerard heard triple F. If Sam goes out and throws a pick six or they go three and out and San Jose State yeah. goes down and scores and, and you're a, down 7 nothing. Yeah. What happens to the psyche of this football team? I agree with that. Yeah, no, I. I That's I, why I don't think he can take any chances with starting anybody but Shane Bouchelle. If Shane is healthy, even if he's healthy enough to say, "Look, we're just going to go in and we're going to hand it off sixty times, and we'll have three different wildcat packages, whatever." But you know, Rod, you you played with plenty of guys at all levels of football where the coach will go to the guy and say, "Look, I know you're hurt." And I know we're, you you can only do certain things. I need you to practice today. Yeah, practice is your different presence when you're out is. There. I need you to practice. Yeah. I think if Shane Bouchel can just stand there and just be a guy that hands the ball off, maybe throws an occasional, like just quick out or something, whatever he can handle. I just think the presence of Shane Bouchel being on the field is the most important thing. And I th- I I'm trying to get inside Tom Herman's head, and I think I, he's that, that's thinking a good point. the presence of Shane Bouchel on the field is the most important thing for this football team right now. No, you're right. Avoids the quarterback controversy. They don't need a split locker room. I, I'll i say this, though, but then you have to weigh what if he gets hurt? What if the – what if you know what I mean? What if the injury is exacerbated in that game somehow and then you still got to get ready for USC in the Big 12? Like, that's what you got to weigh. I think yeah. – but you know I, I think Because he even put said out you there. can't let a disappointment turn into a distraction being this last loss. Now you can't let a little maybe one-week injury, injury become yeah. a long-term so, one. You know what I mean? So it, I think it's That's easier, weighing a lot of stuff. You know I what I mean? I think it's easier to go to – in that in your scenario, I think it's easier to go to Ellinger if the Bouchelle option is complete. Completely off the table if you don't have a choice. But you're willing to risk like the injury, risk him getting injured rather than have the quarterback controversy, which could split the locker room potentially. I think I I think this team rod is fragile mentally as it is. Yeah, 
I know. Yeah. No, I, I, no, I, I'm not it's saying. It's a gamble either I, way. I, no, I would say either way is a gamble. It's a hell of a gamble. I, 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 and I we don't know how bad he's hurt. Maybe we don't. We don't know. The maybe he doesn't though. practice on Tuesday, yeah. and maybe you and know. And I got. I'm with you. I have a feeling he's in. The, he's gonna end up playing. They just gonna. He's gonna end up playing. But man, it is a risk because if something happens to Shane Bouchard, he falls wrong. Anything, you know what I mean? Some one of the old linemen misses a block. Anything. At that and, point, at that point, you, you gotta know. hope you start hot and that you get up twenty eight nothing in the second quarter, and then be like, okay. Now we can put Sam in, let him get some reps, and keep Shane in the glass yeah. case over here. So I, I, I haven't, uh, you know, San Jose State. I don't expect him to <laughs> put a ton of pressure on on Jay Bouchelle. But anything hey, man, happen, man, they got him sixteen nothing on South Florida so, in Charlie's debut. Yeah, so I'm like, yeah, man. I I tend to want to side with keeping my my starting quarterback. And you said they they got Shane Bouchelle as the starting quarterback. He's the guy. Everybody else may be thinking about a quarterback conversation, but the coaches know who their guy is. Keep that guy healthy at all costs. If mm-hmm. you can if you can get a W and keep him healthy, which a lot of people believe you can do that by sitting him and then playing with Sam Ellinger, I'm, I might want to do it just because, man, I don't want Shane to get hurt. I, I, I think then this team gives up. It's thinking about, so you wish splitting the locker room with the quarterback controversy or the team totally – Giving up on the season if Shane Bouchel gets hurt on top of the loss we're, to open the season. Yeah, we're ba- we're back to the Argo plan, Rod. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're back to the Argo right. plan so, with quarterback. Yeah. You're right about that. You're we don't right. know how bad he's hurt, but as far as we know, we're back to the Argo plan. What's the best bad idea we've got the right best, now? That, that is, yeah, it is the best bad idea. I, I think either way, I think I think your, your uh, scenario is the more likely one, that he will play, just won't practice all week, and it'll be a vanilla game plan where he's handing off the damn ball and throwing wide receiver screens and not getting in any you know heat. He'll have a spider pad, and you know those old school braces, like those black arm braces that like tapes your shoulder to like your shoulder pads. Where <laughs> yeah. You can like Jeff yeah. Bagwell. You can like, beat Uncle you can Rico in it. Yeah. Uncle Rico, yeah, yeah. All of those mountains. Man, full circle back to Case McCoy. In Tom, yeah, Tom's gonna go hand a Bouchel a DVD or whatever. Say, hey, we'll watch his Case McCoy highlights, and we'll man. figure out how to how to make this work. Oh well, uh, man, I was talking about former games last night, they were doing the 2011 or is the last time versus A and M, and it's right yeah. before the drive. of Case McCoy is a big run, the 25 yard run. Unbelievable! Have you seen yourself in the background? You go up and you had just finished giving a report, and you can see the sheer elation. You're giving a high five. I think there's one of Swindell's <laughs> friends, like, "Oh, look, Case McCoy just went 25 <laughs> yards. We're about to beat the Aggies." Oh, dude! But look, right before that, they're talking about how improbable of a run it is, and all it is is your big smile, high five, and you're like, "Yep." Here comes Because I want to say that was Case's longest run of the season. Probably. By his career, 25 maybe. yards to get yeah. into field goal range. So unlike. I had so to watch that again. I forgot how we came back in minute 30 and moved all the way downfield. It was like a penalty and then that big run. But, yeah. Yeah, that was a miracle. Who knew two years later at the end of Rod's time with IMG that it would go down in Provo the way it did with Rod. <laughs> with Rod having a completely different look on his face. Yeah, that photo Seething. is the photo right there on our SoundCloud page. So everybody <laughs> sees it. Oh man! Oh, um, I, probably, I had a look similar to that after the Maryland game, or right during it. I assure you. Yeah, you know, like I said, when I when I was in the press box watching, it reminded me of like K State in 07 or UCLA in '10, where I'm just like, <laughs> and I was in the stands for the UCLA '10 game, and I just was leaving, too. Like, man, how the hell that did was that was the most perplexing because Texas's decade had been so great, yeah. and you're like, ah, oh, they just were rusty to start out, and it, then it was like, okay, well they'll come back, and then and when it's that last defensive touchdown, you're down by 20 something at home. Greg Davis unleashed the horizontal offense. Yeah, that was the <laughs> punt, two punt returns inside the five that were fumbled, and yeah, no, and then Man. you're talking about the DJ Moore oh, getting his film about tape. That. You said Brown's the 07 day. Kansas, that was the Jordy Nelson day. Whenever he was found by the rest of the world, who yeah. knows where he would have came from if we hadn't put up. I think it was 11 for 207 against Texas yeah. that day. Beast. So basically, what you're saying is every time Jordy Nelson signs a contract <laughs> extension, he should send Larry McDuff his cut. <laughs> for real, McDuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was the name of like a serial killer when I was a little kid. His name was Kenneth, though. I'd, I'd like, I'd like that Larry McDuff defense back right about now. Um, Texas was a. Nah, turns, it not. turns out the 2007 team that Mac hated that won 10 games. Maybe they weren't so bad after all. All hey, those man. 10 win it, teams weren't so bad. Exactly. We'd kill. We were just the, trying to get to nine wins, and you sound like a homer now. Rod, those, B, those you were got first co- world problems. And those then. were in 11 game seasons. Yeah. Those weren't even 12 game seasons. Yeah. Rod, like, B, you got called a bum for winning 11 games. Yeah, I did. People got on us. Chris Sims got uh, Mac almost got tires canned. slashed and rocks thrown at his car just because he only could win 10 games. How's your boy Sims liking the NBC gig? Uh, he's liking. I had talked to him a ton. He's been real busy, but uh, yeah, man, he's 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 loving it. 
He is. I mean, NBC gig, eh? Yeah, he's pro football talk with him, and he's uh, oh, doing nice. Notre stuff Dame. stuff with Notre Dame, too, Notre like Dame, their yeah. in like studio, their studio show. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Golden Dome. And uh, people, Sims. yeah, exactly. Longwood <laughs> fans hate Chris Sims, and, you know, I mean, I got one, what, I think the fourth most games in Texas football history. Yeah. So, low one fans, that was the first world problems. Now we're dealing with real issues. Yeah, one like, time was the winningest Maryland. coach in his – or uh, quarterback in history until Vince broke. Well, you had Street, Vince, and Colt. Those are the only ones ahead of him, yeah. I believe. And yeah. here's, the, here's the reality with Maryland. I'll be real honest. I think D.J. Durkin's a hell of a coach. He is. And, and since Texas A&M is going to be on a coaching search any minute now – um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, w- I, would, I would like to think some of the powers that be at A and M look at DJ Durkin because he spent en- he's right he spent enough time with Harbaugh and I think five minutes around Jim Harbaugh is enough to have some of yeah. that rub off on you. Yeah, and if, but yeah. but being a DC for a year and being in the meeting rooms, uh, man, that Maryland played kind of like a Jim Harbaugh team, just gritty and nasty and physical, and <laughs> you can see some of that. That kind of Urban Meyer, Jim Harbaugh, rub. definitely people talk, Harbaugh run game. People talk about Tom Herman's pedigree. DJ Durkin's got a hell of a pedigree too. Man, he showed me. He came down here and outcoached Tom Herman in Texas, and they smacked Texas in the mouth mm. and beat, beat Texas in on the line of scrimmage. Essentially, pushed the offensive line and the defensive lines around. I was impressed with Maryland, and I was told by all the Maryland fans I talked to, the diehard ones who made their way to Texas, that they want. That's not a good football team. That Maryland's not a good football team. They're about a six, maybe seven win team. In yeah, the they're, Big Ten. they're about an average football team at best. On a good day, they're an average football team, is what their fans are saying. And yet, they came down here to Texas and look like gang. I mean, they just look wait till they play. Off, wait till they run through the big, the big three in the Big Ten East with Ohio State, and oh, yeah. Penn State, and Michigan, and you'll see the kind of team Maryland is. Yeah. But they had speed. Which they makes had more me worry sp- about the team Texas is then. That, that, that's kind of the point I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to make. Like, yeah. yeah. That yeah. Maryland that's team. That's not good. Yeah, that Maryland team, trust me, that's like, not. Crab cakes and football, that's yeah. what Maryland does. It was a joke <laughs> from <laughs> the <laughs> wedding <laughs> crashers. It's like it literally was a joke, and now they come and whoop Texas. Well, it's back, like the so. UCLA team that beat Texas. What was that UCLA team? That New Heisel, uh, Little Jerry. Was like four was and eight. Backup. Yeah. Let me look at yeah. Yeah, UCLA was 4-8 in 2010. Even like the Ole Miss team that came here, that West Virginia team, BYU team. I've had a lot of situations in the last eight the years. Case, where the K-State team in 2007, the Ron Prince team, they were 5-7. and seven. Yeah. When all these good Texas. teams come to Texas not expecting to win, and then they leave elated. Like, I remember walking out with – Cal, fans. Cal wasn't very good. Exactly, Cal but even, was not very yeah, good. It's, it seems like every year, though, it's been like that for the non-conference home game. When yeah. you look back, ever since the, I mean, I mean, and some of the teams were good. Like that Ole Miss team wasn't bad, or when West Virginia was new to the conference, they weren't bad. But all these wins were big time program wins that they hadn't had wins like that in like a decade. No, yeah, you're right. Maryland hadn't beaten uh, ranked teams. Oh, since seven 2000, years. 2010, 2010, NC I State. think. Yeah. Yeah. No, I uh, barely ranked, and we shouldn't have been ranked too. But yeah. Yeah, we. Sh- I don't know why we. Well, were that's ranked. the that, that, polls that, are just. Yeah, retar- I that mean, is you sit around and you, we talked about the faux momentum that Herman was smartly able to capitalize on on social media, just the natural hype that comes with taking over a program with change, with instilling hope, and then how th- once the season comes, you could really get that momentum to just snowball and become something exponentially good, but also you quickly can be exposed as a fraud if, like, that full momentum is exactly just that off-the-field momentum and then you get out yep. there the first game and lose. So that's sort of where you're at when you look at there's a lot of hype and a lot of things surrounding it and good job capitalizing it on the offseason. But now once the season got there, you also got to do that too. I'm just looking at uh, DJ Durkin's track record, the guys he's worked for. Worked for Urban Meyer, yeah, nice, yeah. Tyrone Willingham, nice culture Harbaugh, resume, huh? Uh, Urban, Urban again. Yeah, Must Champ, uh, Harbaugh again. Pretty good. Yeah. No, that that team that team looked like a they had the physicality of the Big Ten, but they had some speed on the outside at skill positions too. DJ Durkin studied the school of Will Must Champ. It all makes sense now. It all makes sense now, <laughs> man. man. I, I, I was Texas. cracking up laughing. Did y'all see Must Champ talking about the eclipse? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was yeah, so yeah. good. He, yeah. Like he didn't even know what it was. And am I supposed <laughs> to like uh, get my kids to go inside? Or we're practicing, and we'll have to play that later on this. For fall. those of hilarious. for those of you who are not loyal Blitz listeners, you know mm-hmm. the three of us we worship at the altar. Of Will Muschamp. Yes. We do love some Will Muschamp. Yes. Will Muschamp is our. Uh, I don't Man. know, our spiritual force. He's like our spirit yeah. animal, our football, yeah, football spirit animal. Thank you, Rod. Is Will Muschamp? Yeah. It's like the mascot of the Blitz almost. 
pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I trust me. I, I, I think it's interesting though. Just going back to like the, I guess the shock of Maryland. Maryland, um, like I knew that Maryland was you know good at like running the ball and they had a couple of uh, good athletes, but the, the there was a coaching element that it gave them an advantage. You know right. what I mean? Like, and I didn't think that advantage was significant enough to overcome the athletic uh, skill advantage that Texas obviously had, but it was. So that is that makes me hopeful though, because I still believe Tom Herman to be the guy. He just had a bad day. He got out coached. They got out played. He had a bad day. They it got happens. worked. They got worked. It happens, man. Trust me. I've had plenty of those. Here, so everybody see that? Got control. Everybody just do your job. <laughs> see. If everybody just listen to Must Champ, just practice yeah, right. do gap your control, job. do your job, you'll be fine. Um, it's that simple. Uh, it, 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 coaching, coaching matters. And if Tom Herman and his group are the guys that you know that we've been hyping them up to be, then this will bring out the best in Tom Herman. This will test his testicular fortitude, his motivational psychology, uh, his, his his football acumen as an offensive guru. All of that will be tested way before we thought it was going to be tested versus USC or Oklahoma because this may be the biggest test of the season just to see if he can come back and turn around and how quickly he can turn around, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the self-esteem and the negative momentum that the season has already started with. So I, you know, I got faith. I do have faith in the team. I just lowered my expectations immensely. <laughs> All right, I started off eight to nine wins. This we got to start at five wins. Yeah, and luckily, then we have to try to, uh, you know, r- rationalize six and seven wins. And I'm serious about that. Like, and I'm not. That doesn't mean that they are. They're not going to get any better. Yeah, but they. This is not a. This is a below average football team. Because yes. yeah. like Maryland is an five, average seven, football five, team, and, and Maryland whipped Texas. They only scored 20 points, whipped them. Now, could Texas grow into being a, an above-average team? Oh, I yeah, mean, no absolutely. question. Yeah, it's happening. But right now, time. we're seeing we're – They're seeing a below-average football team. Right now, yes. They're a 5-17. and 17. They're the same team last year except they have Tom Herman. But that, that's hopeful because we believe that Tom Herman, with more time to implement this philosophy and culture, these guys will get better. We just have not seen – any sign of that coaching advantage yet or that effect we didn't see any of it i'm fascinated to see and and we talked about the negatives and the things that the things that i don't think are going to get fixed by the san jose state game now, i actually had a little column on the site after the game of five things texas can fix right now and it was like you know make an effort to establish the run uh don't make an effort to get shane Bouchelle killed you know Et cetera, et cetera. Simple things. Yeah. Simple things you can fix. Here's what I think can get fixed. I think schematically you can change up some things on defense yeah. to help you out. Um, I, is it ideally what you want to do? No, but you're not in an ideal situation right now. I think you can make an effort to establish the run. Make yeah. it make a legitimate effort to. Just try. On the flip side of that, I think you're going to have to see what personnel groupings you can. Brad, I didn't see any 20 personnel, did you? I don't remember any now. Okay. Yeah. You're going to have to come up with personnel groupings to compensate for the fact that you don't have a tight end right now that can do what you want to do. Yep. Flex tight end. You just don't. H- yeah, do something. You've got, you've got a flex tight end in Garrett Gray that you're Little trying to Jordan make him Humphrey, into a tight you end. You can flex him out. You maybe. can do some different things, but you can Put can't. him in the backfield. Let, do 20 personnel with Little Jordan Humphrey. The best run they had all day was him in the wild. You could do that. Yeah. yeah. He could be an H back for you. on the inside slot. You had a tight end, but then him at the slot trying yeah. to at least get that mismatch. You're going to have to come up with some kind of – got to be other, creative. That can be fixed. You're going to have to come up with some kind of way yeah. to compensate. What I think doesn't get fixed – and let me stick with the more positives. I mentioned Shane Bouchelle I thought played really well. I thought yeah. Puna Ford played really hard. Mm-hmm. I thought the wide receivers, except any player where they tried to run a pick, which those were some of the worst executed – Oh, yeah. Rub routes yeah. and picks I've ever seen Dude, in my what, life. Yeah. John Burke could have been wide that. open for a first down if he wasn't focused yeah. on setting it's a like pick. Somebody has not taught them how to run a pick route. You just run at, but run at them, but don't grab. Stop don't, and yeah, just run. Like I at saw them. Gerard hurt like <laughs> arms extended. Like son, what are you doing? Are you doing? Just, just, they were already blocking. Yeah, pick. Look at his numbers and run right at his chest. Don't. I don't understand how they. Yeah, I don't know how you mess. And up the one with Burt with his. I mean, if he just literally continues like you're saying, just runs at him. Just run. He probably gets the ball thrown to him because he just nobody was even around yeah. him. Instead, he ran straight into him. I don't get it. Yeah. Um, That's simple stuff. So, I thought Bouchelle played really well. I thought the wide receivers overall as a group played really well. That's a talented group. I think you probably, you probably found a punt returner. 
with Reggie Hemphill. I think you do. No doubt. Um, I thought, this, as much as we hammered on the DBs, I thought Deshaun Elliott played really well. Was one of your best guys on defense. Yeah. I thought Puna Ford played hard. I like what you got in bur- spurts from Charles Amenahu. Yeah. Um, other than that, I'm pretty much out of positives. Yeah, I guess Your field so. goal team was a disaster. Punter should uh, have had more opportunities, but he did. Punter should have had more opportunities. Yeah. Your kick your kickoff return team for the third head coach in a row is a freaking Disaster. just catastrophe. It's yeah. a flaming landfill. Your kick return team. I don't even know. Yeah. I don't know who, who they I don't know what you could do. I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know what you could do. They're worse this year. Oh, well, you you got if you're Texas, here's your best hope for if you're a Texas fan watching Texas when Texas receives a kickoff. Hope to God that somebody's got like a Tom Dempsey leg and can put one through the back of the end zone and you just start at the 25. Uh, yeah. I'm just hope I'm just, the opposing kicker has a club foot and can boom it out of the back of the end zone. I'm just happy you when start they at catch the 25. It. When That's they catch it. it clean, I'm like, good job. Good job. Just going to oh, clean. Oh, that's on a kickoff, bro. It it's a kickoff. I know, man. A kickoff. My expectations are low. And I asked Tom Herman about the press conference. He said, we practice kick, catch, and kickoffs every day. Really? They do? Because it well, didn't look like it. Well, I he did, did say that they didn't practice off-schedule kicks, which is something that no. he needs to do. Well, no, they didn't work on that? Well, no, he said that <laughs> no. they didn't. And I it, couldn't have guessed that. But I think that is something that's indicative that if you are used to just kicking a routine kickoff and not when they're How intentional. about tell the return guy to move up five yards? True, <laughs> but they haven't practiced it. So if you haven't practiced a kickoff. It's kick- a kickoff. All right, but it's I just. It's building a kickoff. If it's that simple, it's that simple. I'm saying that I think that if you haven't practiced You're a Division One football player on scholarship. It's a kickoff. It's the True. Big 12. Yep. It's not a punt. The damn <laughs> ball's coming right at you end over end. Well, these were coming 20 yards in front of you. They weren't coming right at them. That's what the issue was. So that's what I'm saying Rod, about practicing something that's no, going to be off that. schedule kicks. Situation you're going to see that. Rod, this, this goes back to this type of kicks. This goes, gonna, yeah. this goes back to football. exploit that constantly if you don't practice This it. goes back to football IQ. If a coach calls a bad coverage, you say to yourself, "No, we're not. We're not running that. We're running. We'll run this bracket right here because we, we know that that coverage isn't going to work. That coverage is going to If the be. coach doesn't tell you to move up five yards, I got to be smart enough. You know what? The last one hit two yards in front of me. So why don't I move up to where they're trying to kick it? I'll be and we had some up backs. I'll be aware of it. Return some kicks. So whenever you had the up backs return it, but I think it was because it was in that no man's land. They're trying to land them at the fifteen twenty. So now you have to have good communication because each time it was Very the true. guy that was the blocker yeah. guy. He the, was actually yeah. going up to he block, close, and then but the he was ball lands to the ball. and yeah. it kicks hits them never, because it's oblong. So no, it makes right. sense to me. Maybe I seen a high school game where it happened. Yeah, I can't remember watching a college football game where I saw a team have three kickoffs bounce in front of the return man in the field of play. Yep, miscommunication. Mm. But if you haven't practiced yeah. it, you need to start practicing. Matt, I don't think that's something that you need to practice. Why? Well, obviously, obviously after the, they do. After the first one, you should have your ass together. Obviously, Point they do. Being, though they didn't, and yeah. now you can't it's just like say North okay, Carolina State stupid, having three punch block. That's you think, not how you do it. You think people would be able to to block, but yeah. they they don't. Obviously, you got to practice it more. They're messing it up. Yeah, they got to oh. practice more. They have to be prepared. As, as they just have to communicate. It's like calling a fly ball. It is. If you don't have two guys call the fly ball, they might run into each other, or they might not touch it. Yeah. And that's just why you've got to call it, and it's that simple. But you also have to communicate that. I don't think fielding the kickoff should be that damn hard. No, it shouldn't it be. It shouldn't be that hard. But, but now the, we're talking about actually how you take, like, implement success and actually field it. Yeah, that's how you remedy it, man. you got to practice it. Hope, Obviously, they never seen it before. Hope you've got a club-footed soccer-style kicker that's got, like, Janikowski's leg. <laughs> but then they're going to, on the purpose, 25. kick it short on yeah, purpose. Yeah, people now, that's it's like, it's like getting beat time. as a defensive back. Now – our corners are going to get tested get all year long. Yep. Because they got beat early on. You gave them the on. film. You gave them the film. You go out there, you shut people down. People are like, no, nah, I'm not. I'm not, we're not throwing it at that guy. speaking of the kickoff and so coaching So now and they're going to be doing those sky kicks every time. Speaking of the kickoff and coaching mistakes, why after the first one hitting the field of play, why would you put Daniel Young back there? And I love Daniel Young, but you got a true freshman who's never touched the ball in a game in his life, his first Division One game. And if you know they're going to do the pop-up kick, Rod, why would you put a true freshman back there to handle it? That's a good question, actually. Yeah, I don't know about that. That's a good question. I don't know. That's the kind of stuff that's there like – questionable decisions in that you're game. You're beating you know? yourself. You know, questionable decisions. I I remember – I mean, not that we're talking a ton. I remember going back to the offense and they had the fourth and – Fourth thing. Oh, goal, how have we not talked about that and yet? And no Colin Johnson. Colin Johnson wasn't hmm. on the field. And I was like – Man, it was fourth and goal. You ain't got college. you ain't got your six six wide receiver on the field. That 
the, the even if you're not gonna throw it to him, just have him out there. A distraction. It's like Reggie Bush being out the field right? on the fourth and two. Here's my problem. Here's, here's my issue with that. Two things on the fourth down. I don't disagree with going for it on fourth. No, downs. you can go for it. That's that's you as a coach. That's your. I prerogative. disagree with the play call. It was terrible. On, on oh, two the, of the empty. Fourth downs. Yeah, the the you, motion out. You little empty Chris set. Warren. You just showed your hand. Yeah. You, you basically made yourself one dimensional. Mm-hmm. Yes, you made, yourself you made much, yourself easy to defend. You made yourself one and took out. You made yourself one dimensional into. Uh, it's got to be a pass play unless you're going to run. Shane and then Michelle. you take out the best guy. And, and then you take you out that? the best option. The uh, only guy that can play on another plane. It's the that guy you know, that you can yes. be covered. And He's he literally can make it six touchdown. inches or more taller than the defensive back like, who's guarding him. The only if, guy with a built-in advantage. This is this is the stuff I have a problem and with. It's with. Like, I didn't get that. I These are my biggest that. issues with the, like, the with the coaching staff in this game. It's you got first and you got first and goal with the five. I would hope Chris Warren can get. We're back to like Sean Watson level stuff. I would hope Chris Warren's good enough to be able to get you five yards in three plays. He didn't. Well, and Herman well, said they, though, they didn't give it to him. Keep doing they that. gave they it like to him that. twice, right? And then on third down, you run a screen to Garrett Gray. Like that's what that's what you call. That's what you no, want to do. I, even Garrett, I apologize. Garrett, if Garrett Gray Gray's was surprised par- by that. Yeah, screen. I apologize like, if Garrett what Gray's what parents are listening to he this caught show. Caught the ball like why'd you throw it to me? <laughs> that's, <laughs> and that's why, like, I like the idea that he's gonna. And he said that he will every single time. If you have three plays on the five, we're going for it. But then it's the implementation. So at least well, that's something that you can just fix. If it's just play calling, it was. Then it's then that's maybe they fixable. were bad play calls. But uh, I think yeah. part of that was. I I know he said he doesn't like 20-yard field goals. I think he didn't have any confidence in Josh Rowland at that point. Well, no, but I agree with that. After the missed field goal and the block. Probably part of the panic you talked about, too, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? But even then, like you're – Not believing in 20-yard field goals, though. You look back uh, in Herman's history, he doesn't do that. The cost-benefit of possibly getting a touchdown, it it outweighs it. He'll make that that decision I get that. But here's my point on the thing I disagree with. The play call – Rod, even if Chris Warren catches that ball, he catches it at the four yard line, and there's three guys waiting right there to yeah, tackle why, it. Yeah, why why throw it outside the end zone when all you got to do is get throw it four yards into the end zone? I agree with you. I I didn't understand it. I didn't. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. But my the point of I was I'm with you. That should it should have been more threats in the end zone for him. That should have been the the check down. If you that will. was where the it offense just like, seemed discombobulated. Yeah. It just seemed rushed and hurried. Like yeah. they didn't really know what they wanted to and do. How do you not have the money play ready for your for your for the red zone? Like fourth and Everybody's like first and goal on the five. Yeah, you got you're supposed to have like a, a separate book. Like okay, I high, school high school teams have high school teams have those. Yeah. I remember in high school, it's like this. If we ever had to go for two in, in a critical situation, exactly. this, this is the play, play we're running. This is the play. If we, we got, got fourth and goal inside the five, this is what we're going. So with. their fourth and five play was uh, an empty Warren backfield. Or Chris Warren starts in the backfield, go to the empty set without Colin Johnson on the field, and they threw. A, you ran the Greg Davis play where you throw a five yards shorter where you got to be. Essentially, yeah. That that uh, I so I questioned the the play calling. And the main thing you threw they went the, empty again. When they're covered. Yeah. On their, on their that was the one down. I thought you were talking about. They had. Four Fourth no, and two around I, midfield, yeah. and they went empty. And then I think it was just a scramble by Shane. It had yeah, to because you had nowhere to throw the yeah, ball. Yeah. Like, yeah, made yourself one dimension. You motioned Chris Warren out of the backfield on that one too. Keep your two hundred fifty pound back in there at because, least. Keep him honest. Exactly because if that guy two hundred and fifty sixty pounds, he's running downhill. He can get two yards. He can fall forward. And at get least, it. at least put if you want, okay. Let's say you want yeah. the ball in Shane Bouchel's hands on a run play, which I think would be. The last thing I would want to do on fourth down, other yeah. than throw it to Garrett Gray, that would be one of the last things I want to do because I don't want to get my quarterback killed. Man. But at least have him fake a read to Chris Warren because right. if I'm a linebacker, I'm thinking the 250-pound back is getting the ball on fourth and two. Man. I, 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 I Running thought... behind Connor Williams, I'm thinking that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to sell out there. And if the quarterback beats me on the edge on his own read, then yeah. so be it. Yeah, instead of – so both of the fourth and shorts we're talking about, one, you motion Chris Warren out of the back to make him a receiver. And then the other one, yeah, you motioned him out and like back across the formation, across the slipped formation. him. Not even into the flat, you slipped him like behind the line of scrimmage. Some yeah. like I don't even know. So what yeah, was I going I on. agree with that. I don't know. I, I don't I don't know the thinking behind it. That didn't make any sense. And the that only worrisome sense. thing that I saw from Bouchelle at times throughout the game was almost as if he the intended receiver and that one being Warren. And then when three guys are on him, was locked in and never really seemed to go. Then break off of schedule to try to find that last option. There were a few throws. That that it seemed like he tried to force into who the intended receiver was, where at times you maybe had another better option, maybe one that would have been in uh, the end zone on that play. Because there were three guys on top of Warren. Glad you mentioned that, that Matt. This is my one criticism of Shane Bouchelle, is I think when it's a, it's not a not to say he's a single read quarterback, but when it's a predetermined thing where he knows mm-hmm. where he's got to go with the football. He's within he, the system. He's very good. 
Yeah. Very good. Off schedule. But when it breaks down and it's off schedule, it's and, and, and it's it just it seemed like sometimes Rod he was guessing. Where well, to go even with the like ball. whenever yeah. he was running out of bounds, whenever instead of just throwing it out of bounds to get an incompletion, instead you take a three yard loss because you didn't even think about the ability to throw it out. Just little processing things that true. went off schedule. It seems like, and it, it's asking a lot to expect somebody to be good in those off schedule I know. situations. But, let's remember but it still- just sort of shows where he is as a quarterback. Let's remember development. he's still a true sophomore exactly. in That's a exactly new system, say, too. Right. No, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So even he probably is a little more hesitant and gun-shy at yeah. times about decision-making. I think he was put in bad positions sometimes. Hell, the play, we're talking about that fourth and two from the 46-yard right line or something. Yeah. Right, right on the field. Hell, they're supposed to punt that ball. It's 30, the score is 34 to 37-34 then. And you got the best punter in the country, and you don't punt and the I ball. I think at that to, time, you know what I mean, to force them to. The, and mm-hmm. that, the, that the starting quarterback is done is out of the game, so you can make them march ninety some yards with the backup quarterback, play. and you oh, chose to man. go for it on fourth and two, and it's a bad play call on fourth and two. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, yeah, that was it, Shane shouldn't even been there, and I believe Shane might have got sacked on that one, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see. I'm looking at the defensive series leading up to that, Matt. I know we got to wrap this up and get to some picks, but. Um, let's see. You I think it was 37-34 at that time. I was on a 46. Make it the 44, yeah, uh, let me look at my play-by-play right here. Either way, that was a situation where you could easily. That's, you get, you, that's hitting your artists. Yep. And, and, and that's, the, that's the group that Tom Herman coaches. <laughs> he coaches the punt the team. That was his group. He didn't want them on the field. Defense had gone three and outs, uh, three and outs. They allow the Maryland score there to make it 37-27. Yeah. And then it's a three and out. Or, no, Kasim Hill comes in. That's like a four, five-play drive. Um, and then, yeah, so the defense had actually been playing well for a couple series at that point. They have to let them play with 90 yards at their back. You know what I mean? And a true mm-hmm. freshman quarterback. And you know they're going to be conservative in their play calling with a true freshman quarterback. With you know, in deep in their own territory, to me that was that was a Tom Herman decision. I love the roll of the dice, but I think it it backfired on. All right, we got to get to some picks to close this. Picks, out. cool, cool. Well, Let's starting off last week, uh, I went four and one. Rod was three and two. Jeff was oh. one and four. So yeah, I'm thanks on. a lot, A and M. Oh, Thanks yeah. a lot, Aggies. You Don't believe in that. Aggies. And then you, yeah, you picked Good against Saban too. I picked against the, and, and I yeah. realized like in the, the the second quarter of that game, I'm like, oh man, I forgot I just picked against Nick picked Saban. Against Nick that was Saban. a bad Mm-mm. move Mm-mm. against one of and his. DeAndre Francois is out for the year now. Yeah, that's Florida terrible. State. Gosh, yeah. that's awful. That's the best bad news for them. Well, starting off, we already mentioned them earlier today, but Muschamps boy, South Carolina at Missouri. Who you got? Oh, I'm taking the Fighting Muschamps all the way. They will do their job. It'll be gap control, and they will do their job. Against Missouri on the horrible turf up there. Yeah, is it a know. is it a home game or a road game, Matt? Uh, it's at Missouri. It's at Missouri. On a horrible turf, I'll take uh, I'll take I'll take South Carolina. No, I I haven't done enough research on Missouri actually. I yeah, I don't know anything about any yeah, of these teams. Um, but I went I'll, four and one last week. That is true. <laughs> okay. They left the Big Twelve, Rod. F them. Pick uh, against them. I'm going. Yeah, I'm, actually, I'm gonna go with Muschamp. He's our football spirit animal. Yeah, we'll I'll go, go with, with the we'll Fighting go Muschamp. Muschamp. Well, yeah, I'm going Muschamp. on the other side. Going to take the Tigers, Missouri at home. But to the next one, Oklahoma, Ohio State. Who you got? Ooh. Okay, this is in Columbus. Ooh. Yeah. That Indiana Texas game. Longhorns, the first team to ever Indiana go Ohio in. Ohio State game was interesting game early game. on. Yeah, it was. And, and Oklahoma can do some of those things. I'll tell you what, though. Yeah. One of the best kids I've ever met since I've been covering recruiting, the best, just best people, is J.K. Dobbins. Oh, yeah? And to oh, okay. see him go Oh, yeah, the running back, night. the young running back for Ohio Ooh. State. Good player. 200 yards. Yeah. Tom Hermel. Yeah. How, that's gonna that's gonna be one that like Texas fans be like, how do you let a kid from Lagrange, Texas, an hour down the road, get away to Columbus, Ohio? Mm, yeah, five and seven. That's how that happens. <laughs> Lose to Kansas. And it that's might happen how that again. Happens. Yeah, you go five and seven. Um, Ohio State, Oklahoma. Mm. I'm I'm leaning towards going with Ohio State. Yeah, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go with Ohio State. Because I think Ohio State's got the horses up front to give Baker Mayfield a hard time. And when Baker Mayfield's faced an athletic pressure defense Mm -hmm. where you get your athletes in the right place, he struggled, even Texas in 2015, which was the best game Vance Bedford called while he was here. Um, I'll I'll take Ohio State to win that game. I agree with you. I think Ohio State, they're deep on the front seven. So I think, yeah, I think Ohio State can – Corral Baker Mayfield enough. Give him some some issues. I'm taking the Buckeyes yeah. at the Horseshoe next game. Another big one will be Texas's uh, opponent in a couple weeks. But Stanford at USC. 
Oh. Stanford oh. At, at USC. USC. Mm-hmm. That's oh Stanford. Stanford had went over to Australia. Beat, beat the hell out of Rice. Yeah. yeah. Stanford is just tough. Yeah, because you know what kind of ball they play. I, I, I think Sam Darnold is the difference, but this game is close, and USC will get their nose bloodied big time in this one. I'll, I'll take USC in a very, very close physical game. I think Sam Darnold is going to be the difference. Yeah, what was it? Uh, was it Western Michigan? Yeah, twenty-eight, played USC. twenty-eight, fourth quarter. Yeah, they played USC pretty tough, actually. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, oh man, this is, I'll take USC because I, I, I think Sam Darnold's legit, so I, I think he'll get better. He didn't have a great week one either. So I think he'll be – I think that team, the fact they didn't have a great week one will help him I'm out. I'm hesitant about this because I really worry about against that Stanford run game, that Man, USC that power, front yeah. seven. I, everybody does. Yeah. That Stanford running game, when it's going downhill, man, it's hard to stop. But yep. I'll take USC. I'll take the talent. I'll go USC with the Trojans, the too. Yeah. All right, next game going to be another good one. It's Herman's four. Okay, can I change team. my pick then? Because I, I got to try to get some I games back. I was literally This is how you're going to just keep losing. I was just going to – but I was just going to ask the same thing because when both of y'all picked, I was like, I, I got to go just the I got to get a game back. I got to close the I got to get okay. a game back on you guys. It's a long season. You don't have to no, take I one did game. No, I did Look. All right. Everybody should know I'm the crazy a-hole that just makes rational picks on the – irrational picks on this game. I'm the guy that does picks with Stanford. All right, you have switched your pick. Only Ryan yes. and I, thank you. We'll, we'll take the touchdown home favorite. All right, now going I'm going to regret that just like I regretted picking A&M. Over now, because I was going to do the same thing, actually. That's not All a bad right. pick. Now going to Houston. It's Major Applewhite going to Arizona to take on oh, the Wildcats. Oh, man. Cats. You know what, man? Oh, that's, that is. Yeah, it's a long trip for a team that's been through a lot. You know what I mean? Mm. I Ari- wanted to, Arizona's but, not very good, though. And I very yeah, I'm worried about the distraction though. The, the they're calling that the Hurricane Harvey kind of uh, you know aftermath, and it's the distraction for all the Texas teams. And I do wonder <sighs> if one that's closest to home, U of H, are they inspired by all the events, or are they distracted by all the events? That's the question. Yeah, that's just, usually about your coach and how focused he can get you in that time span. That's a major question. If you have faith in major, they win. If you don't have faith in major, then don't pick them because they're gonna be distracted. Screw it. I think U of H is a better football team. I'm going U of H. Yep. I'm going U of H. I think they play inspired. Y'all are going to hate me. I am going U of H as well. Son of a. It's all right. Hey, I got to get a game up on you guys somewhere. I'll, I'll roll with Stanford instead of Arizona. All right. Last game. one. Uh, hopefully we bo- all get this one right. It's San Jose State and the Longhorns. What's boy, your prediction, senor? Boy, if this one goes the, the opposite way, then we might just cancel the blitz altogether. <laughs> Just Man. get out of town, or just start drinking on the show. Just tell people what's going on up front. That we That'd got a bo- we got a bottle of Jack going around between next the three of us. Oh, that's not about it. Oh yeah, we may actually. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Yeah, stay tuned. By the yeah. way, we might I'm have still some news on that. coming up here yeah. uh, very very soon. Um, I want to go with Texas. I'll say Texas wins thirty four to ten. Oh, we don't know what's going to happen with quarterbacks and all that kind of stuff. I think Texas wins 38 to 38 to 38 to 9. I'm going to say no touchdown by San Jose State. Yeah, what's the spread on this? No touchdown. Uh, it's went, it started at 26 and a half. It went up to 28 and a half earlier today, but then it's back down I've seen anywhere twenty eight to twenty seven. Man, that's in that way range. too big. Um, yeah, I think I, actually I'll go. Yeah, I'll change. My, I'll go thirty eight to seventeen. Because I, I yeah I, I don't think I'll this go. Texas, I'll defense, go. That would be it's, it's shaky. I'm yeah, gonna to go San it. Jose State to cover. Yeah, San Jose. I'll go San Jose State to cover. Nice and then yeah, I think I got twenty one, so I'm close to them. Co- yep. co- got them covering. You got I'm at twenty four. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think Texas offense may be a little bit more improved, but definitely not one if, to cover if, a poor touchdown. Depending touch on there. what happens with Bouchelle, I mean, I don't know. That's a good Very question, true. too. That's what we don't know. And that will affect the line, I'm sure of it. It mm. might already be affecting the line. Yeah, possibly it is because it did come back down after being way back up. Half the public's on San Jose State, too. But I'll take Texas to win 42-20. to 20. Yeah, I think, yeah, I would. If I'm trying to make some money, I think I'd put it on San Jose State. Actually. Yeah, I said to take Maryland last week. Yeah, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was like, I, I thought Maryland was as bad as San Jose State. We've, I think that's an indictment. You guys realize in a week we've gone from being so optimistic to not expecting them to cover. I guess the team that coming into San the year. I guess the team coming into the year, I thought, you know, they're right there with, like, you know, Texas State and some other schools as far as maybe being the worst FBS team in the country. 
Well, they have familiarity, too. That's what's scary. They know our personnel big time. What, Andrew Souter? The Andrew assistant? Souter was an he's offensive analyst at Texas last year. So, and uh, now he's their OC. San Jose State's going to be running the uh, veer and shoot. So he knows the personnel really well. Yeah. Yeah. He was Sterling's little right-hand man youngster that he had hired on, basically. Sterling's if we're getting guy. into – X's and O's discussions where we're worried about San Jose State knowing personnel. <laughs> yeah, we are. I am. Yeah. I'm we worried. just lost to Maryland in a game that we're about as favored as much as this one. It's yeah. a touchdown difference. Exactly. It's yeah. about 19 or 26 yeah, points. Yeah. It's and that yeah. was at home against yeah. What yeah. the hell has happened? Be one day. What the hell has happened in one week? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, we drank it's, the Kool-Aid. This is what happens when we drink the Kool-Aid, man. It's those same the hangover, players that yeah. lost to Kansas two games ago yeah. were out there this past Saturday. That hangover from drinking that Kool-Aid is tough, man. That's a hell of a fall it's from like grace. It's like that cheap wine. Or like it is. Cheap, like it's like drinking that box wine. Or like mm-hmm. black velvet whiskey or something yeah. like that. It's, 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 it sticks with you. The you cheap might stuff, vomit yeah. it back up You get that cheap stuff. It's in like the plastic. Yeah, You wake up sweating. Yes. Uh, dry heaving. It's, yep. like, it's like when I used to drink McCormick's vodka and orange juice back uh-huh. in the day. There yes. you go. The cheap stuff. That's what it is. That's what that drink, that burnt orange Kool-Aid One good thing, Texas fans can sort of get a little bit of tailgate in this time. I hate 11 a.m. games. I didn't even go down there. I was very happy that I didn't go to the game after seeing what happened and all, but I would have been very upset if I spent like 100 bucks <sighs> to Matt. go see that. Matt, thanks for everything, man. Oh, You're more than welcome, Rob, you appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. Mad for Rod for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. Damn for straight. everybody at 104.9, the Horn, Craig Way, Bucky Gobble, Aaron Hogan, Chad and Kevin, everybody, Trey, BK, everybody up here, great relationship we've got with the 104.9, the Horn family. We are happy to be here. You can get this podcast right now only at the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. But, yes. Matt, we are working on getting that updated. Yes, yes. Here the, we're doing stuff with the Horn. So hopefully it will be all running like all their podcasts here very soon. And we'll be also tweeting out info if uh, y'all fans may be able to come join us for some shows this fall. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening. And we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.